Everyone had a chance to go over their journals? Forgot that yesterday. Double duty today. Matters of privilege and recognition of guests, the Honorable Premier. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome all of my colleagues back to the Legislature, those who are joining us in the public gallery and those who are tuned in online uh, for today's proceedings. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to begin by just uh, uh, making Islanders aware of the uh, uh, Come Fill Your Boots uh, campaign that's taking place this weekend, even in the these hard days of, uh, of impact to our potato industry, it amazes me that we've come together and how they've all come together in the industry and they're offering up potatoes to Islanders uh, free of charge, Mr. Speaker, to help address some food security issues here in the province and they're doing everything they can to attempt from diverting these uh, perfectly good and healthy potatoes to be uh, diverted and destroyed. Uh, so this Saturday from 10 till 2 at various open house locations, uh, G. Visser and Sons, uh, K.A. Rose and Sons, Blue Bay Farms, uh, Vanco Farms and W.P. Griffin, w. P. Griffin, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, so I encourage all Islanders to go out and show their support uh, for our potato uh, producers in this province. I want to also offer my congratulations uh, to Kelsey Verzati, Mr. Speaker, who's been chosen uh, to play the icon uh, iconic role of Anne Shirley in this summer's production of Anne of Green Gables, the musical at the Confederation Center of the Arts. Uh, it's, uh, Anne has been on a two-year hiatus uh, and we'll all be very, very happy to see her back on the stage, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Kelsey was born in Calgary and is based out of Toronto and will be the first actor of Asian descent, Mr. Speaker, to play Anne, which is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful, wonderful thing, uh, particularly when you consider how popular Anne Shirley has been in parts of Asia over the last uh, number of years, Mr. Speaker. So I look forward to uh, uh, seeing Kelsey on the stage and I can't wait to see uh, theater uh, again uh, at uh, the Confederation Center and other uh, venues across PEI. And just finally, Mr. Speaker, uh, I don't often do this, but we uh, we have a, a loss uh, in my in my hometown and community. Uh, John Walsh Sr. Uh, passed away yesterday after uh, an illness, Mr. Speaker, and uh, he was a, a dairy farmer from uh, Burnt Point, uh, which is. Uh, the suburbs of Greater Georgetown, for those of you who don't know, and uh, a dairy farmer, a community volunteer, uh, an absolutely pillar of community, M Mr. Speaker, and, and uh, a giant of my youth. Uh, we've had minor hockey and minor baseball when I was a kid because of people like John Wall Sr. and uh, uh, I'm just uh, sad that we have lost him. Um, I always called him the best MLA we never had. John lost a by-election in 1988. Uh, and uh, actually, and I told him this when I had a call with him a couple of weeks ago. He wasn't doing well, but I gave him a call and we had a great chat. And he was a great friend of my father's and actually was a pallbearer at my father's funeral. Uh, but John ran for the PC party in 1988. And my father, uh, as most know, was a, a fierce and partisan liberal. Uh, and uh, it really uh, struck me in 1988 that my father didn't talk. Uh, to John for 30 days during the campaign and I think in some ways, in many ways, that event helped shape the way I've tried to approach politics here in this province, Mr. Speaker, and to try to dull off the sharp edges of, of, of politics and uh, uh, John was gracious throughout all of that, Mr. Speaker. He was a, uh, years later, was I say, was a pallbearer at my father's funeral, but I uh, just, uh, I, to, to John's family, to, to Mary Lou, to, to Kenny, to John Jr., to, to Michael, to Greg, Kevin and Karen and the extended families to all who knew them, I offer my, uh, my sympathies uh, on uh, what really is, Mr. Speaker, if there ever was one, a life very well lived. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to acknowledge what a beautiful tribute that was. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I'd like to welcome Bethany Collicott McNabb and her son Peter beside her there um, here for the proceedings today. So glad you're here, Bethany, checking out our wardrobe and making sure we're grammatically accurate during the sitting here. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, this, this is uh, Pink Shirt Day, of course, and you look around the legislature and you can see pink shirts and pink ties and pink jackets. And um, it's a day when we lift each other up and we remember uh, to accept each other and to be inclusive and uh, uh, of everybody in our community. And since its inception in 2007, in 
school in Nova Scotia, it's grown into an international day and far beyond, beyond the schools. And I, there was a beautiful message from uh, Dr. Ramdeep Dosan, who is the president of the British Columbia Doctors Association. And he said this when issuing a statement today on workplace bullying. He says, this pink shirt day and every day, I challenge you to speak up for yourself and for others. This is how we will change what is accepted in our workplaces, in our communities, and in society. Our future generations, Peter, task us with the leadership we need to aspire to today. So let's, let's remember that as we go about our business. And again, I want to reference the Premier's uh, opening remarks there. Um, the, the ability that we have here to get on together. Um, I was also really happy to read in the news yesterday that Lennon House is expanding its, uh, uh, its offerings, if I can put it that way. It's a, a wonderful uh, facility in Rustico, uh, which provides um, long-term comfort and solace and training, life training, for people who are struggling with mental health and addiction issues. And the founder, Diane Young, has done absolutely extraordinary work there. And I want to, I want to make special note uh, of this government's financial commitment to that institution. Uh, it was in the early days of COVID that government made a commitment to fund Lennon House and continues to do so. And for that, I and many, many islanders are, are grateful and, and I trust we will continue to do that. Anyway, the expansion there is to uh, build a, a little community of tiny houses in a piece of property that's been donated to Lennon House right adjacent to the what used to be the, well, you, you know where Lennon House is, uh, in one of the fields there. And that will provide that transition. I mean, one of the problems with addictions and mental health is it tends to be a revolving door. And the, the approach of Lennon House is to offer that full spectrum, long-term approach so that people can move through addictions and mental health challenges and come back into society as, as fully functioning, contributing members. And, and this will be another part of that puzzle. So thank you, Diane, for the work you're doing there. Uh, and finally, and the, the Premier mentioned this, uh, yesterday we talked in this House uh, about the potato situation here on Prince Edward Island. And uh, many of us would have heard um, the potato farmers, Randy Visser, this morning on, on the radio talking about that extraordinarily, extraordinary, generous thing that they're doing, um, the Fill the Boots campaign. And I, I want to also acknowledge that at this most difficult time that our farmers are still offering um, that sense of generosity to our community. And it's, of course, being reciprocated by islanders. We, um, today, I, I think it's important that we thank all of those indiv individuals and groups across PEI who have stepped forward to support our farmers. And among those, uh, the community connections in Summerside, who um, in one day uh, applied 20,000 stickers um, to potato bags from the Garden Isle um, place. So uh, those, those potatoes, of course, are uh, destined for Port Puerto Rico. And there are other places. Residents at the Gillis Lodge um, did, did a similar thing for G. Vissers and Son. Uh, and the South Shore Pharmacy in Crapo is one of the many businesses and organizations that purchase PEI potatoes in bulk to give away to, to their, uh, the people who use that facility. So, Good on you, farmers, for continuing this generosity, and good on you, islanders, for being there to support our farmers. It's a wonderful reciprocal thing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Donable leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And once again, it's great to be back here, to be able to stand up and uh, welcome everyone and uh, say a few words here today. Mr. Speaker, today is Pink Shirt Day, which is the day to call out bullying and put an end to it. We can disagree on issues without dismissing the value of another person, and it's also important that we respect, we show respect for others, especially when it is unpopular. Everyone deserves respect and kindness, and we have a responsibility to set a good example as leaders and as citizens here on Prince Edward Island, which we do every day. Mr. Speaker, I'm also very proud of the district I represent, Evangeline Muskush, and all the musicians in this district. And tonight, there will be an Evangeline Bluegrass and Traditional Music Festival Association kickoff of a concert series online. The concerts will start and they are free of charge and will feature wonderful performers from across PEI, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. So I encourage everyone to tune in. 
Mr. Speaker, also to the comments of the Premier and the Leader of the Opposition, the Fill Your Boots campaign is, is just a testament of the wonderful folks we have here on PEI. And you look at an industry that's in devastation doing something like this, and Islanders coming together. And I know there's been other uh, retailers and businesses and individuals that have gave away free potatoes, but it just goes to show what we all do here on PEI to support one another. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to see the Shinrix vaccine rollout which officially began this week to Islanders over 65. It was disappointing that it took so long, but we are very happy to see this government take our recommendation, and we think it's wonderful. Over 32,000 Islanders were eligible for this. I know some of them would have gotten it, but not all could because of the expense. Uh, as I had indicated in this House before, I had shingles twice. It's not a pleasant thing to have, so I think this is wonderful that government has done this, and I commend government for this. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I, too, wanted to rise today and uh, just recognize uh, all that the potato farmers uh, are going through uh, here on the island. Uh, there's many in my district, District 18, Rustico Emerald. I uh, want to say hello to everyone who may be watching. And, I heard Kayla Newhoff on the radio this morning. She did a great job. And of course, the Newhoff family at Blue Bay Farms is one of the farms uh, that are, are hosting the Fill Your Boot this, this weekend. And um, I, I wanted to just um, remind people they can go out um, Saturday, February 26th, between 10 and, and 2 p.m. And uh, Mr. Speaker, they, they do write that uh, also in their Facebook post that food banks all over Canada are being supplied with potatoes from PEI even though they have many more left. So I thank them for that as well, because uh, it's really great to, to help our most vulnerable. And Mr. Speaker, uh, speaking of Lennon House and, and their, their initiatives and the great work they do, um, I, I'm really uh, happy to be working with, with them as, uh, to support them in, the, in their, their tiny house initiative as much as possible. And, and Mr. Speaker, the land that's being donated, I think, may even... Uh, the New Newhoff family and Blue Bay Farms may be involved in that as well. So it just goes to show you how communities work together, and when they do that, everybody benefits. And Mr. Speaker, I wanted to recognize um, the Mid Isle Matrix organization. Of course, my son plays hockey with them, and la ha they have a Matrix fights cancer campaign that's going on right now uh, across all their their age groups. Uh, my son plays the U13, but they. Uh, they had a great home game uh, fundraiser last night. They're giving all the, the money raised to the QEH Foundation. And they raised $380 through the 50-50. Slightly more than we get uh, at the 50-50 at our old-timers game, Mr. Speaker. And it's, it's, it's great to see, and I want to thank them for that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Anyone else? No? Member statement. The Honourable Member from Town Valley, Sherbrooke, and the third party win. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Opposition win. Yes. <laughs> uh, on February 8th, the provincial government released Moving On, Transition Plan to Living with COVID-19, and we had further updates today. I have heard from many who are looking forward to next steps for our economy and our society. However, as government relaxes restrictions and moves toward a new normal, we must not forget the frontline workers who are asking, we are asking to take an, on additional risk of contracting COVID-19 at their workplaces. Dr. Morrison and CPHO have stressed again and again the importance of staying home when you are sick. Throughout the pandemic, health experts, labor organizations, and economists have stressed the importance of paid sick leave in preventing the spread of illnesses like COVID-19. Lack of sick leave can lead to prolonged illness, reduced productivity and economic disruption, and the further transmission of disease. Inadequate paid sick leave disproportionately impacts the most economically and medically vulnerable. Lower income workers are the least likely to have paid sick leave, while also being the least likely to be able to work from home. We must make sure no worker has to choose between paying the bills, putting food on the table, and going to work sick. Government has an opportunity to plan now for the future by adapting and targeting current COVID-19 support programs, such as the Special Leave Fund, to support smaller businesses in the transition to providing permanent paid sick days for all workers. Keeping community spread low in the long term will be critical to a thriving economy, to protecting vulnerable islanders and our healthcare system, 
and to avoiding the need for restrictions in the future. This is why I will be bringing forward amendments to the Employment Standards Act to ensure all PEI workers will have access to paid sick days when they need them. A consultation draft of this legislation is available now on the official opposition website. We invite all Islanders to review this draft and provide feedback before Friday, March 4th. I want to thank all PEI workers who continue to work throughout the pandemic and those who will sustain our economy into the future. You deserve to live healthy and well. You deserve to be able to take the time you need to heal if you are sick. It's time for us to build back better for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Mermaid, Stratford, and the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today is Pink Shirt Day. This year's theme, Lift Each Other Up, in, um, is about embracing diversity, respect, acceptance, and inclusion for everyone. This is a day that we will see a lot of people speaking out against bullying. I believe it's important to speak out about bullying, but I also think it's important to check our own backyards to ensure that we are not creating environments where bullying can happen. A workplace that is free from bullies thrives, Mr. Speaker. It benefits from low employee absenteeism and low turnover rates, not to mention a positive and fulfilling workplace for everyone. Does that sound like your government departments? Ministers, do you have a, work, a, a workplace free from bullying? Are your staff happy? What does, your government, what does your department's absenteeism look like? What is the turnover rate? Do you lead a workplace that embraces diversity, respects all staff, and includes everyone? Have you personally talked to your frontline staff um, employees to find out if they are happy in their workplaces? Mr. Speaker, the quality of leadership in an organization can contribute to a bullying culture. According to the, medical, the American Medical Association, bullying is prevalent in healthcare. Poor staffing le levels, ex excessive workloads, subpar management skills, stress, and a lack of aut autonomy are some of the factors that contribute to workplace bullying. That sounds like the environment that our healthcare workers are, are experiencing right here in PEI. The person who has full authority to change these conditions is the Minister of Health himself. Mr. Speaker, do healthcare workers on PEI face bullying in the workplace? Bullying in healthcare is so well documented and no one should be surprised if the Minister answered yes, some do. I expect the answer to be yes because I have spoken to current employees and some that have retired, workers that are out on stress leave and are terrified to go back because of the working conditions that they were in. I've spoken to people that have transferred out of their units, transferred out of their department, and exited the profession completely for exactly that reason. So what do we do about it? The first step is acknowledging bullying, bullying in the workplace. Um, sorry, the first step is to addressing, it, to addressing bullying in the workplace is to first acknowledge that it exists. Then addressing that problem requires total commitment at every point in the healthcare ecosystem, from the individual level to the organizational, including policy and advocacy for prevention. But if the minister does not admit that there is a problem, then we have no chance to address the issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Not all Islanders have experienced the pandemic in the same way. For many, it has been a very scary, overwhelming and tiring experience that is not going to end even as the restrictions are lifted and we begin to move back into business as usual. For some people with disabilities, for seniors, the immunocompromised, kids under five and those unable to get a vaccine, this pandemic has been completely isolating and they will continue to be left behind as the rest of us go out and about. As we unmask, they are at even greater risk. We know that this government loves to talk about how it's about people. Good neighbours taking care of each other, the gentle island and our folksy charm and goodwill seeing us through. But over and over during these past two years, we've seen that for this government, it's about people should actually have a big asterisk next to it. Some conditions apply. If you're a low-income islander or working a minimum job with no contract, some conditions apply. 
If you're an international student or a newcomer with no social safety net, then some conditions will apply. If you're a person with a disability or a senior with limited resources, some conditions will apply. And if you're a parent whose kids are too young to be vaccinated yet, conditions apply too. Over and over, the official opposition has fought to fill the gaps in programs and services that would otherwise leave our most vulnerable populations unsupported. These are gaps that a government that really is for everyone should never have left unfilled. We fought for financial supports during the early days of the pandemic for workers, international students and community groups. We fought for rental subsidies and parental leave, cash for nonprofits, daycares and caregivers. We're still fighting for paid sick leave, for tenant protection, for a secure and dignified retirement for our seniors, for increased supports for people with disabilities, safe shelter for the homeless, and real support for those struggling with mental illness or addiction. We all want the pandemic to be over. We need our shops and services open for business with people working and the economy rebounding. But we cannot forget that we must include all islanders in that story of fresh starts. No conditions applied. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For our first question, I'll call on the honorable member of the official opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We all want COVID to be over, and today Prince Edward Island essentially declared that by joining the growing group of jurisdictions that are accelerating the lifting of restrictions. However, I've heard from many island who, islanders who are uneasy with the pace of change, especially given the numbers of cases that we are continuing to see. Living with COVID must not mean ignoring the virus altogether, which in many respects this government's plan seems to do. A question to the Premier. What do you say to our vulnerable populations, our elders and our kids and the family members who love them, who may be fearful of this rate of change? Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Leader of the Opposition for the question, and uh, I think uh, he did sum it up quite nicely at the beginning, that we do all want this to be over. It's been a terrible time for everybody, Mr. Speaker, uh, and uh, it's uh, something that, uh, you know, we can't will our way through. We have to work our way through, which we have been doing, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I continue uh, to take the advice of our Chief Public Health Office. Uh, that has informed every one of our decisions, Mr. Speaker, and as we work our way through this, that will continue to be the, uh, uh, the process, Mr. Speaker. I do understand that there are people uh, uh, that are uh, happy, people that aren't happy. We've had that throughout the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I do think a certain amount of this comes down to the fact, as I said in the briefing today, that we've been living with this for so long. We have the scars and bruises to prove it, Mr. Speaker, and every time we look to move out of it, uh, there's a little bit of angst with it. I, I share that. I have that. Uh, Dr. Morrison has that, and I'm sure all Islanders do, Mr. Speaker, but uh, we're following uh, the best science and health information that we have, and we're working our way through it, and that's the best information that, uh, uh, that I can take, Mr. Speaker, and I just want everyone to continue to do the best they can to get through and pass this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today's announcement by the Premier fails to protect those at highest risk of harm from COVID-19, and it neglects some of the most vulnerable people in our society. You just announced a plan two weeks ago. That was the advice you received from the Chief Public Health Officer, yeah. and now it's gone. So. We have to ask yourself what you have to ask yourself what has changed, because the science has not changed. Indeed, with subvariants of Omicron circulating widely and the increasingly increasingly worrying spectre of long COVID, things in that regard are actually getting worse, more concerning. The science hasn't changed, but we also know that the premier is under pressure from a convoy protest being planned for PEI. To the premier, to the premier. Why did you abandon the plan based on the advice of the CPHO? And why did you change your mind so drastically, so suddenly, and so soon? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Leader uh, for the question. Look, this has been a difficult two years. Uh, 
If I made decisions based on uh, groups of people disagreeing with me, Mr. Speaker, we would never uh, get anything done. We followed the information, Mr. Speaker. The science uh, hasn't changed, Mr. Speaker, but the science in PEI has changed. The science of Omicron has changed, as Dr. Morrison articulated today. Uh, prior to Omicron, Mr. Speaker, if you were unvaccinated, you had a greater rate of transmission of the virus uh, than, uh, than people who were vaccinated, Mr. Speaker. Omicron has changed that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're following the evidence. We're following the science, Mr. Speaker. And I know that people don't agree with that. Some people don't, some do, Mr. Speaker. But every decision we have made throughout this has been of that ilk, Mr. Speaker, that some people agree, some people don't. Uh, we're just trying to do the best to get through it, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we'll continue to do that. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. The International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, a UN treaty, signed and ratified by Canada recognizes the right to adequate housing and, expert and expects signatories to that to work towards a progressive realization of housing as a human right. A question to the Premier. Will you recognize housing as a human right and tell this House how we're working here on Prince Edward Island to implement this right throughout the entirety of our province? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I certainly have tried to do everything that we can and accelerate all the plans that we have to make sure there's adequate housing for um, Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker, that matches the economic growth we've seen, the population growth that we've seen, Mr. Speaker, and the needs of more and more islanders, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're trying very hard to do that, Mr. Speaker. I don't think it's out of uh, uh, the, 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 the rights of anyone or the wants of anyone to have a place to call home, Mr. Speaker, and there needs to be respect for that, whether you pay a mortgage to the bank or pay a rent to, uh, to a leasee, Mr. Speaker. That has to be someone's home, and I want to recognize and do everything we can in that regard, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have continued to make these investments. We will continue to make them, Mr. Speaker, and uh, no government, mine or others, should stop until such time as everyone has a good place to call home. The Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. I did not hear in that response any recognition of housing as a basic human right. Our housing crisis is directly tied to a government failure to adequately invest in housing, particularly public housing. It has meant not only less units on the market to rent, but rapidly increasing rent in private rentals. Question to the Premier. Why does government think the best strategy for our economy is the continued over-reliance on private investment to provide affordable housing? Mr. Speaker, I actually think quite the opposite. I think we have to be open uh, to all aspects, Mr. Speaker. Uh, public housing, of course. We have to have co-op housing and other aspects, Mr. Speaker. And our government's working very hard to ensure we make those investments in that regard, Mr. Speaker. It is a difficult file, not just for PEI, for all provinces in the country, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing incredible population growth in Prince Edward Island. And I've said in this legislature many, many times, when we saw the beginning of the boom of our population in the, in the early 2000s, Mr. Speaker, we were slow to react, Mr. Speaker, and we've been playing catch-up ever since. We continue to play catch-up, but we're trying, Mr. Speaker, to make the investments that we have. And all aspects of the housing quantum need to be uh, part of it, Mr. Speaker. Public, private, uh, social, all of these things. Co-op housing, Mr. Speaker, all need to play a role for us to get through. The Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. The Premier references all kinds of housing that we need here, co-op housing, public housing, private housing. But the only place that this government is investing is in privately funded uh, housing. And we need to get over that. The, the, the recent uh, rapid housing initiative offered by the federal government, other jurisdictions in Nova Scotia took advantage of that, converted entire hotels into affordable public housing. We did nothing here. The CMHC released its 2021 uh, rental market survey report, which calculated vacancy rate and average rental rates on Prince Edward Island for October 2021. The numbers for PEI are not positive. The vacancy rate has dropped from 2.2% to 1.3%, back into critical territory. Last sitting, when I asked the Premier whether he had still had confidence in his Minister of Housing, the Premier told this House he had full confidence in his Cabinet. Does the Premier view declining vacancy rates and increasingly unaffordable rents as a sign that this minister is actually performing well. Honourable Premier. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I suppose if I wanted to boil it down to some kind of political partisan uh, debate, I would uh, engage there, but I, I won't. I don't think this is the day for that, and I don't think this is the issue for that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have a housing uh, sector that is, uh, continues to be invested in and is growing, Mr. Speaker, but we did continue, uh, in case you haven't noticed and you continue to ignore, uh, we are the fastest growing province in the country, Mr. Speaker. People want to be here. Would People choose to live here. We're making the investments, Mr. Speaker, but there's also limitations to how fast we can build, Mr. Speaker, and it takes all aspects to continue to address this issue, Mr. Speaker. And if there was a magic bullet answer, Mr. Speaker, I promise Islanders we would have done it already. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Mr. Speaker, we've been years to build, mm -hmm. and I would love to hear your government say just once that they believe housing is a human right. We've heard from community groups who want government to acquire existing housing stock in the community to ensure it can continue to be used as affordable housing. In fact, we've <laughs> seen some provinces access generous federal funds to acquire these types of units, which we also have access to, but for some reason we will not take it. Question to the Minister for Social Development and Housing. What are government's immediate plans to buy existing rental units in the community to ensure their continued availability and use as affordable housing? Well, uh, well thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and Mr. Speaker, let me, let me start off by saying that when we talk about housing as a human right. We believe in that. That's something that we work towards, and um, that's something we openly admit. There, you've heard it, for the record. Now, the other thing is uh, we, we are working um, to the, the, the issue you're talking about. We want to provide more housing and new housing, and we want to, we want to act in, increase our social housing. So what we're looking at doing is we're buying new housing that's coming up duplexes, multi-unit dwellings, these sort of things, and so that we can provide additional housing, additional social housing, and, and uh, you'll see that we'll have uh, a number of announcements in the future of places that we have bought. When we buy existing housing and renovate it, uh, we can do that. As long as we're adding uh, you know, new units to that, then we're increasing the housing. Um, and it's important to make sure that that housing is in good shape as well, and of course we got the new Residential Tenancy Act that will help with that as well. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. I would love for us to get to the point where we're not looking anymore, where we're not talking anymore, where we're making those announcements. According to a recent Statistics Canada report on food insecurity, tenants are much more likely than homeowners to face food insecurity. Only 5.9% of homeowner households were food insecure, compared to 21.5% of renters. Clearly, renters are paying more than they can afford and having to make very difficult choices, impossible choices. Question to the Minister, what are you doing to address this glaring gap in their quality of life? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it's no secret that we've seen uh, land prices, property values, as well as rents uh, go up uh, significantly for new buildings, of course, on Prince Edward Island. Prince Edward Island is a unique jurisdiction because we have had rent controls in place on Prince Edward Island for 30 years. And Mr. Speaker, that, that is one thing that um, really does, does protect tenants, and that's something we're not changing in our rewrite of, of the legislation. So, but Mr. Speaker, what, the, 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 the statistics don't lie, and I, and I, agree, I agree with the member that, uh, you know, that, that tenants uh, you know, may be uh, more at risk than, than homeowners. I think what we're doing um, is for those uh, where we're providing mobile rental vouchers, for example, to help close that gap when they are paying above a, you know, the CMHC definition of 30% or 25% or is what we'll we use in the province. And uh, we'll continue to, uh, to try and address that gap. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Mobile renter vo rental vouchers are great for a short-term fix, but that's all it seems that, that we hear from your government. The 2021 report of the Chief Public Health Office officer noted that housing and good indoor air quality are also requirements for living a healthy life. Housing that is not safe, affordable or secure can increase the risk of many health problems. Housing that is not affordable decreases the amount of money available to a household to meet other social determinants of health. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What are you doing to follow Dr. Morrison's advice regarding housing? Uh, 
Councillor Bowden and Housing. Well, well, well thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, um, I mean, I, I agree that uh, when it comes to air quality and safety, that's paramount in, in housing. And, uh, and Mr. Speaker, um, you know, we're, we're rewriting our uh, Rental Residential Properties Act. It's going to be the new Residential Tenancy Act. And uh, we're, we want to make sure as well that, that it's enforced. And so, Mr. Speaker, I, I think that uh, the member across who's, who's seen the act will notice that uh, well, you know, it, 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 it is an obligation to make sure that, uh, in particular, rentals are safe. And, and that's the legislation is going to reinforce that, and we're going to have an investigations team that helps as well to, uh, to make sure that that's happening. And so that's just one of the things we're doing to make sure that uh, housing is safe and the air quality is good. Thank you. John Bell, member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Some jurisdictions in Canada are seeing massive growth in housing speculation. In Ontario, more than 25% of new home buyers are investors. In fact, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada said that domestic investors have been fueling the rapid rise in, rise in housing prices. A report from BMO last year suggested a speculation tax is a potential option to curb speculative housing activity. We have similarly asked government here to introduce a vacancy tax, but government has not yet acted and has let speculation run unchecked. Question to the Minister of Finance. What tax policy measures, if any, is your government proposing to meaningfully discourage speculative housing activity in PEI? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, uh, we are currently reviewing what a vacancy tax can look like. We know the federal government is going to uh, bring forward a vacancy tax. We uh, understand the parameters around that right now. It's, our big concern is what that will look like for uh, islanders who have family members living away, who own a cottage. Uh, there are a number of issues that we need to deal with to ensure that the tax is put in place for the right reason and targets the right people who, who, are, who have a Four Seasons home here that is not being utilized. So we are working on that, and we'll continue to work on that. And the federal government has come up with what they plan on doing, which would just affect the immediate Charlottetown area, which is not uh, really the focus that we have as a government. So, uh, honourable member, you can be assured that we are continuing to work on that, and and we'll find an answer. Honourable member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Well, that's the same answer we've been getting since March 2020. So. And uh, while we are aware that the federal government is working on this, I'm particularly concerned that the finance minister doesn't think that homeowners in Charlottetown deserve the same level of attention that homeowners in the rest of PEI do. After all, that's 36,000 people live in Charlottetown, so it is somewhat of a concern. While the CMHC rental report announced today paints a worrying picture for renters, the situation for homeowners is just as bad. Entry-level first-time buyer homes are no longer affordable for an average islander, which prevents them from moving out of the rental market. It's clogging up the market. It's why we're seeing that vacancy rate go down. A mini home in PEI is now selling regularly for over a quarter of a million dollars. Almost all of the homes purchased through the government's down payment assistance program are in rural PEI, 95% of them, which suggests that no one in my constituency in Charlottetown would be eligible for this program. Question to the Minister of Economic, Growth, Tourism and Culture. How will you be adjusting the down payment assistance program to ensure that first-time home buyers are able to afford homes in the communities of their choice? Honourable Minister of Economic, Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. So, uh, over the last couple of years, we've certainly seen uh, um, the real estate market boom here in Prince Edward Island, and we've adjusted, I believe, uh, the down payment assistance program once, if not twice, because uh, it's never evolving uh, uh, factor. So uh, even yesterday, I looked. Uh, the, the average house price in Charlottetown alone, I believe, is 404,000 approximately, where the rest of uh, Prince Edward Island is uh, is a little over 300. So so it's a big difference, which fluctuates all the time. Uh, so every three months, we sit down with the department and we look at the stats and uh, make recommendations. So I'll certainly take that back and. Uh, see if anything can be done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. And you're right, it is ever-evolving. And while we're waiting two years for the action to happen, people are being priced out of that market. <laughs> Housing is a basic human need, and it is shameful that we are not satisfying that need for every islander in this province. We recognise the importance of other basic needs like food and water, and this legislature has taken steps to ensure that those resources are protected through the Lands Protection Act and the Water Act. Unfortunately, we have no legislation that guards against the concentration of housing in the hands of the wealthy few. 
Question to the Minister of Finance. Is it time to start looking at regulating the ownership of housing to ensure access to home ownership for those who want it? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member, uh, regulating housing uh, itself sounds like maybe it would be a good idea, but I think that there are many, many issues with that as well. We need to have contractors building those houses who can afford to build them and pay for them. We need to have the ability for the, the people that move into them to also pay their mortgage or their rent, whatever it is. There are a number of parameters we have to look at. We know that construction is through the roof here on PEI. Even getting a home built is almost uh, something that, that can't happen immediately. So, Honourable Member, there are a lot of challenges, and we know with our population growing and our economy booming that there are a number of departments that are uh, dealing with that across the board. We know there are issues out there. We continue to work with Islanders every day, and we will, we will continue to do that, uh, Honourable Member. Thank you. Madam Valley Sherbrooke. Housing is not just important for people to live with dignity. It's a critical piece of our economy. It is a fantasy to believe that skilled workers will move to PEI when the housing prices are comparable to big cities, but the salaries are half as much. <laughs> Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Do you think our current housing market encourages or discourages young islanders and skilled workers to live and work on Prince Edward Island? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. So uh, what is happening in PEI uh, right now with the, with the housing is no different than any other province in the country right now. It's, uh, it's, it's late to the game for PEI. We've seen it happen in the rest of the country, uh, but now PEI is starting to feel the effects of it. There's many reasons for that. We're getting lots of young people wanting to move home. Uh, they they miss, miss home. They want to move home. We have great opportunity here. And COVID, over the last couple of years, has really changed the mind of people and the, the path they want to go forward in life and we're attracting a lot more people here from other provinces. So it's an ever-evolving issue. Uh, what I can say is everybody has to have a role in it. Government needs to play a big part of this, and that's why we've got to continue upskilling workers, get them to work, uh, build, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, level off this soon. It's going to be tough times, but uh, we're going to get through it. Yeah. Yes, government has to play a big part in this, absolutely. And let's be clear, the housing crisis is in large part a result of bad government decisions. The decision to underinvest in public and affordable housing. The decision to leave short-term rentals unregulated. The decision to ignore speculation in the housing market. Some businesses have told us that our housing market mismanagement is creating challenges to filling labour shortages. Question to the same minister, how exactly is your government's approach to housing helping us to attract and retain workers? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And what I can say, going back to what the Premier said, this issue started early in the 2000s with our population growing. And if you look, we've hit a record high population right now. So what we've done, the first time ever in history, uh, after talking to all departments, all departments departments in this government right now meet and they talk what we can do on housing. We throw ideas around. Even my own department, you look at uh, what we've been able to do under Finance PEI and the Residential uh, Fund. We've built over 300 units right now. Uh, we work with social development and housing and uh, constantly look at pieces of land. We've talked to different mun municipalities and communities to say, if you want to build, come. We'll, we'll find a funding path for you. So we're constantly working and we're going to continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, through the housing crisis, we're starting to get a clearer picture of what this government's economic plan looks like in practice. We're seeing islanders being gouged with rising rents and new homeowners being saddled with increasingly risky mortgage debt. At a time when businesses are crying for islanders to support locals, some islanders simply can't because they're struggling to afford the roof over their heads. Question to the same minister. How is this good for stimulating our local economy? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And what we've seen, Honourable Member, over this last two years is inflation. We've seen the cost of goods go up. The average house or price per square foot to build a home right now is $350 a square foot. It's significant, considering three, four years ago we were in the $100, $120 a square foot factor. The cost has gone through the roof. So what government is trying to do is access, develop programs to work with social development housing to support the private sector to be able to build these units and make affordable for people. But it's tough to do with $350 
$1,000 a square foot. And if you look, the average house price right now in Charlottetown is 400000 The time you put the taxes into that, somebody needs to make $4,000 a month just to pay their mortgage. It can't be done. Exactly. <laughs> Charlottetown West Royalty. Mr. Speaker, transitional housing is the mid-step between emergency crisis shelters and permanent housing. It should provide a safe, supportive environment where residents can overcome trauma, begin to address the issues and lead, that lead to homelessness, and start to rebuild their supportive networks. The purpose of transitional housing must be to help vulnerable islanders. In August, October, and January, I submitted written questions to the Minister of Social Development and Housing on transitional housing program. I have not received any answers yet. This is quite concerning. Given that, the Minister had plenty of time to consider the questions I will be asking. My question is to the Minister of Housing. How many Islanders have successfully left transitional housing and have found stable housing in the last year? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. And the member from Charlottetown West Royalty, Mr. Speaker, raises some good points about the importance of trans transitional housing. And, and that's why, you know, really starting in December 2020, we opened Smith Lodge, and we've been using that for transitional housing. Um, and we've been working with our, our partners, like the Salvation Army, for example, to try and, and, and identify the people that can be successful and, and allow them to go through transitional housing so they, they can be successful in their lives. And it's very challenging work, Mr. Speaker. Um, and, and Mr. Speaker, um, it's, it's not about the numbers, Mr. Speaker. It's about, it's about the efforts put in, and, it, and, it's a, and it's a long and it's a lengthy process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, it's, it's not about the effort put in. It's about the people behind that who need the service. And you mentioned Smith Lodge. An announcement was 28, 28 beds. That's nowhere near that. Right now, it's half of that. Mr. Speaker, like I said, the purpose of transitional housing is to help Islanders shift to permanent housing with support from you, Minister. If the Minister doesn't know how many Islanders have left transitional housing, how does he know if the program is effectively helping those Islanders in need? Question to the same Minister. What metrics and follow-ups does your department track to determine that transitional housing program is achieving its intended purpose? Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And so, uh, in, in the Department of Social Development Housing, and, and especially uh, when we're working with people who are most vulnerable, these are these are the people that uh, you know, are using our shelters, the people that need transitional housing. They're people we know very well. And, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, it's it's not a straight line for someone. We need to meet them where they're at, and we help them. And sometimes they can go to transitional housing, and then and they can make it out, and sometimes they can go back. So we track those, those numbers, uh, and, and we track where those people are at, and we talk to them on a regular basis, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, Mr. Speaker, um, we've been working on those, those written questions for the member, and my apologies for the time it's taken. And when I have those, I'll, I'll table those numbers for him. Thank you. Charlottetown, West Royalty, your second supplement. Yeah, well, and I asked you about the metrics and follow-up, and you said it's not a straight line. We, we, you have to do better, Minister. We have to be able to provide the supports that these islanders need. Um, more needs to be done, done, and standards need to be followed. I recently visited an islander in one of your, your transitional housing units. The condition of the unit was appalling, and the resident couldn't remember when any one of your department had last visited. This is your responsibility, Minister question to, to you. How often do residents get in-person check-ins from your department and will you commit or clarify if transitional housing, if they do get regular support from your department? Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, I, I, I can confidentially or confidently say that the department definitely does provide supports and we partner with a number of NGOs who also provide supports to people. And, and Mr. Speaker, um, I've had questions in this House before about individual cases. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, every single time I've gone and followed up on those individual cases, I've found out that, in fact, there have been supports, they have been looked after, the department is doing their job. And, and if the member wants to get to me, uh, give me the, the name of the person they're working with, I'll go back to the department, I'll do the same for this. But I have a lot of confidence that we are providing supports, and the NGOs we work with are giving supports to these people that they need. Thank you. Tignesh Palmer Rowe, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question today is to the only member of government west of Kensington on a rather alarming situation in West Prince. Now, I've received too many calls about COVID testing sites, and the common theme from Islanders 
in West Prince is the concern about regional access to timely COVID testing sites. PEI is in the worst position we have been in when it comes to the pandemic, yet access to testing is more difficult than ever before. People of West Prince have been turned away from testing sites as early as 11 a.m. due to testing number quota, and I'm also hearing frustration around the lack of consistency in the hours of operation at the West Prince testing site. So my question is to the Minister of Health. Why are the people of West Prince being treated differently when it comes to access to COVID testing sites? Wow, yeah. Mr. Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. We need some help there. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have received the same feedback. Uh, to uh, the Honourable Member's uh, point, though, or assertion that members in West Prince, individuals in West Prince, are treated different than other islanders, Mr. Speaker, that is absolutely not the case. Uh, Mr. Speaker, he states that, uh, you know, that uh, hours have been adjusted. Mr. Speaker, we are not going to be able to provide testing in West Prince, in uh, Slemon Park, any place in the middle of a snowstorm. That is just not going to be able to happen. And yes, that has had an impact. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have partnered, just for example, though, in order to be able to provide additional testing in the West Prince area with uh, Lenox Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And if you're hearing it, do something about it. Yes, yes. You're, you're, you're the voice. You're the voice for Prince County. You're the voice for West Prince that's sitting at the executive table. You're the, you're the person that they elected to, to bring the voice. We want to hear that voice. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the same minister. Who's responsible for making these decisions around a testing site? And if the current sites are not at capacity, or are at capacity, sorry, who is responsible for opening additional sites? Oh, Master of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And yes, Mr. Speaker, I am, and I'm darn proud to be the voice for West Prince. I'm darn proud. But as the Minister, as the Minister of Health and Wellness, I also am the voice for every Islander from North Cape to East Point, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to and have provided as much as possible, and we all know in this house the challenges that we've had throughout the pandemic and certainly recently, Mr. Speaker, with regard to human resources. Mr. Speaker, that is a challenge and that has a an impact on what our testing capacity is. The Honourable Member knows that full well, Mr. Speaker, but we are. We're working collaboratively in partnership. And I did mention, Mr. Speaker, Lennox Island, and I give a shout out to the great people there and to the leadership there to partner with us in providing testing at Lennox. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm just going to give you an example of, of, of a note from a single mother of three children, two with special needs. She, one of her children had to get a PCR test to go back to school because of a close contact. So she went to the Larry Clinic, it was close. Sun Park was closed. She had to go to Borden. She got to Borden, couldn't take the child up the stairs because the child couldn't get access to the building, and the people that were doing the testing would not come out that day because it was too cold. Oh, Told her to come shame, back tomorrow. Shame. So is that standing up for the shame. people of West Prince? Shame. I doubt it. That's not even standing up for Islanders. Oh, so you mentioned Lennox Island. So why is the Minister of Health sending people to a federally funded COVID site in, in, uh, on Lennox Island? So I want to know why he's doing that, and I want to know if he'll commit today to additional testing days, to uh, more hours, and operating um, additional COVID clinics in West Prince. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And uh, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, the member references Lennox Island Federal. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the relationship that we do have, that we as a government have with our federal counterparts. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, he references the individual, that uh, single mom, and I reached out, I reached out directly to her. And Mr. Speaker, maybe, just maybe, the Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road should look not only at the original Facebook post that she put on, but her follow-up to her Facebook post after I spoke with her. I would strongly suggest that he take a look at her. Thank you.
Mr. Prouty. Thank you very much. Speaker, and my question today is to the minister, and I hope he's the voice for seniors, Minister of uh, Housing and Seniors. Mr. Speaker, my question today is to the minister responsible for seniors housing. Personal conflicts among residents and seniors housing are causing many seniors to feel unsafe in their homes. I raised this concern last year on behalf of constituents and was assured by the minister that he would work to improve this situation. But unfortunately, I am being told the minister hasn't actually taken action to improve the situation. Oh. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. What actions have you taken since last December to offer more safety to seniors living in these situations? Mm, good question, good question. Dr. Ambassador of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I want to thank the leader of the third party. Uh, he, uh, he, he was a really strong advocate for our new seniors navigator, and uh, he made it he really made it happen, and I want to thank him for that. It's a, it's a great support for seniors, and we're going to see even more good things coming that way. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've been um, um, focused on um, taking our larger seniors complexes, and um, as a member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, Park knows and Charlottetown West Royalty, looking at um, changing the locks so that we use uh, things like key fobs, putting in security cameras. Uh, we're ramping up our maintenance. Uh, I'm making sure we're putting all the money there that we can. And Mr. Speaker, when it comes to addressing um, tenants that have complex needs, it's extremely difficult. And uh, we're, we, we, we've had to, unfortunately, evict some tenants. Uh, and these are some of the actions we've taken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Don't believe the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we often talk about the quality of life in this House, and in, many, and in my area, a number of people are suffering due to the actions of a few. Like I said, Mr. Speaker, I've been in contact with several families in the Wellington area about an issue, and there is growing frustration about the lack of action from this minister. Mm -hmm. And let me point out, the staff, as he had indicated, and I will indicate, are very dedicated and very helpful when you contact them, but he's the minister of, department, yeah. of the department. However, safety concerns remain, and it is up to the minister to provide a resolution. Question to the same minister. What is your advice to the residents and families who have brought concerns forward but still haven't heard their problems addressed? Mm. Master of Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I do want to thank the member for for bringing this to my attention uh, early on as in my tenure as uh, Minister of Social Development and Housing. And uh, I looked into it right away, and I went and, and met uh, with the member and some of the constituents um, with my Director of Housing at the time, Mr. Speaker. I engaged the manager that looks after the housing there. And Mr. Speaker, um, the member has continually brought this to my attention. Um, I, I work with the experts in that area, and I check in with them on a regular basis to say, are we at the threshold yet where more can be done? Are we addressing the concerns? And, Mr. Speaker, the answer I'm getting back is that uh, we feel we have the situation under control. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll continue to do that. I'll go back again. I want to make sure the people on the front line who are working uh, have their, their voices and are able to take their action. Thank you. Do the leader of the third party or second supplementary? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, people in my community that feel you haven't addressed this and you haven't gotten back to them since their last meeting. Some of these people are elected municipal people that had a conversation with you. When these types of issues go unaddressed, it has the potential to escalate and to boil over into more serious situations. I believe the minister was sincere in his comments here today, but I must say I'm hearing different stories from my constituents and the conditions within seniors' housing. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Why is there such great contradiction between what you are hearing about seniors' housing and what is being brought forward by MLAs and myself? Thank you. Well, well thank you, Mr. Speaker. And let, let me f first say that uh, I want to thank all MLAs when you're bringing forward issues because when you're representing the island, I mean, uh, I can't be everywhere, and you're, you know your constituents the best. Um, and Mr. Speaker, I, I just commit to listen and, and uh, working with my department to take uh, appropriate action. And Mr. Speaker, I, I can understand the frustration of the leader of the third party's constituents because um, in this particular case he's talking about, um, we haven't been able to take probably what they would see as substantial action. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to go back again, and I, I'm going to look at it again, and, and I'm, I'm going to push the envelope and, and say, you know, um, if the situation hasn't changed, can we can we please uh, address this again? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Jonathan, member from Charlottetown-Winslow. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last summer, the federal government uh, made an announcement of a multi-year funding agreement uh, at Murphy's Pharmacy. It was uh, with the province, and it was a step towards creating uh, possibly a national pharmacare program. A uh, question to the Minister of Health today. Um, I'm not sure if he recalls the terms of the agreement with respect to the funding and how long of a period that would cover. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And thank the Honourable Member for the question. He's absolutely right. Uh, last summer there was a letter of intent signed between the federal government and the province for a pilot pharmacare program. Uh, the total dollar amount that was included in that letter of intent, Mr. Speaker, was $35 million. And I know that uh, staff from my department have been working uh, diligently with uh, their federal counterparts to get the terms and conditions of this ironed out, of, uh, of this agreement ironed out. And as I understand, Mr. Speaker, the first dollars actually should be flowing to the province uh, in about uh, mid-March or thereabouts, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Winslow. Oh, that's great news, uh, Mr. Speaker. I really appreciate that from the minister. And now, of course, we know that uh, you know the cost of prescription drugs, especially in PEI and the Atlantic provinces, are sometimes a little bit higher. Uh, I'm actually curious, Mr. Speaker, uh, if this funding will be added for new drugs for the provincial formulary, or if it uh, will be used to lower cost the barriers for the existing drugs. Minister of Health, Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank the member, the honourable member, for the question. Uh, I have not seen the final draft of what this will be covering, Mr. Speaker, so I don't want to, uh, to either raise or diminish expectations. Certainly, my hope is that it would be covering, uh, lowering the cost of, of drugs, but also addressing high-cost drugs as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you look over the last year, the number of new drugs, uh, new medications that have been added to the formulary here in the province of PEI. It's in the vicinity of 80 new medications. Previous to that, the average was about 20 or 22 per year. And it was across the board a couple of great examples of high-cost medications, Ritricafta and Hemlibra. So we have made progress, and we certainly will continue. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Beaumont. Mr. Speaker, the vacancy rate in Summerside is less than 1%. It is 0 0.7. And I just heard the Minister talk about rent controls, but you know as well as I do how well those rent controls are impacting people if they don't have access to representation to help them navigate the mounds of paperwork that they get. You know that as well as I do. And yet, when people's rent goes up above this amount and they're on a fixed income, they have nowhere to go because our vacancy rate is so low in Summerside. And you know that. I've brought this up in the legislature and I got a cavalier answer from the Minister of Justice that people can just go to Iraq. So I'm going to ask again, will you commit to funding legal aid so that tenants can get the help they need and they are not priced out of their community? Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the member from Summerside, Wilmont, brings up a good, uh, a good point. And uh, you know, we do have the folks at uh, Iraq that uh, do handle these, but I, uh, we, I do understand we. They don't. I do understand we need to address this situation, Mr. Speaker, and maybe uh, we, if the budget's coming soon, and maybe there'll be a, a highlight in the budget that we can maybe uh, have this discussion later on, but I will continue to work with the, uh, the member across on addressing this issue so all people have fair access to uh, legal services when they need it the most vulnerable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member from Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Stratford is tied with Summerside for the lowest vacancy rate in the province at 0.7%, and it has the largest increases in rents. I attended an, an Iraq hearing with a constituent, and her rent was being increased by almost half, by almost double. In one year, the average of rents in Stratford has increased $237 a month, and that's in one year. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Is your housing strategy to price everyday islanders out of Stratford, or is it fair to say that you don't actually have a strategy for Stratford at all? Mr. Speaker, and uh, as has been referenced a number of times in the, in the House today, um, most recently the Minister of Economic uh, Growth, Tourism and Culture, 
what we've seen is uh, rising property values. We've seen an increased uh, number of people coming to the province, and this is driving up uh, prices. And of course, Stratford, as we know, is one of the fastest growing communities and, and a de real destination on Prince Edward Island. And I believe that's why you've seen the large increases uh, in rents there. It's a desired place to go. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, one of the things we're doing is we're taking the bull by the horns. We're rewriting the rental, uh, the rental act, the, the legislation that governs the relationship between tenants and landlords that hasn't been touched in 30 years. And we're bringing it in, into uh, the modern area, Mr. Speaker. And one of the things we're doing in that act, um, we haven't tabled it yet, but there's been in the briefing, is um, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, the, the, how the director fits into Iraq and how we work with them, Mr. Speaker. And these are all sort of things that will, will address some of the issues we're hearing in the House today. Thank you. <clears throat> Minister statements. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, we have many remarkable seniors on the island who give their time and energy to our community in so many ways. Today I want to recognize the contributions of five special seniors who have helped build stronger communities across the province for many years. This year's Seniors Islander of the Year Award recipients are Aubrey Arsenault of Tignish, a leader and mentor for young fishermen in Prince County, Anne Morrison of Morrell, whose dedication and passion for literacy helped to change the lives of hundreds of students through tutoring. Hubert McIsaac of Charlottetown, a dedicated community volunteer for over 30 years. Mary Hughes of Stratford, a driving force for the island's palliative care center. And Mary McCormick of Surrey, who has volunteered hundreds of hours in operating the Surrey Foods Bank. The leadership, tenacity, and spirit of these five island, islands, islanders is incredible. My deepest congratulations go out to the recipients and their families. Today is a day to celebrate each of you and acknowledge the investments of time, energy, and compassion you have diligently made to island communities. The Senior Islanders of the Year Awards are given out annually to recognize the significant contributions of seniors in community life, including volunteerism, artistic achievement, fundraising, community participation, fitness and recreation, and other activities. The recognition program is overseen by the great folks at the PEI Senior Secretariat. The lives of Islanders have been improved greatly because of the service work and dedication to community by this year's recipients. I thank them for their continued work, experience and knowledge. They demonstrate, Mr. Speaker, that at any age, Islanders can make a significant impact on community life. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to remind Islanders that it's not too early to start thinking of deserving seniors to nominate for the 2022 award. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I too would like to take this opportunity to congratulate um, the five seniors on, on this uh, amazing accomplishment. Uh, Aubrey Arsenault, Ann Morrison, Hubert McIsaac, Mary Hughes, and Mary McCormick. And in so many ways, Mr. Speaker, this island is what it is because of our seniors. It's their experience It's the, with, in life, in work, in play. Um, that we should be considering all the time um, as we sit in here making policy and, and decisions on uh, programs and services. And the time, energy, and passion that you put into this makes us better. And I was having a conversation with, a, with a, an elder, gosh, it could have been two days ago and it could have been three years ago. Time is, has no meaning at this time. Um, <laughs> it just goes. Um, but I was talking to an elder and we were talking about the future of volunteerism in Prince Edward Island. And we were talking about how inequities for seniors is making it more challenging for them to give up their time, passion and um, energy. Because, you know, as we mentioned earlier, we're having to give up as we consider elders and food insecurity, you know, we're having to prioritize our time and our, and our finances a little bit differently. And so our elders are concerned about the future of volunteerism in Prince Edward Island, as they do 
as they are huge, they form the bulk of our of our volunteer population. And so, a sincere thank you. Um, and you know, despite all of the challenges to to get out and volunteer all of those different things, we know it's a challenge. So thank you for doing that because our communities are stronger because of it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. John Lever from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party house leader. I'd like to thank the minister for this important announcement, and this is important to recognize Aubrey and Ann Morrison and Hubert and Mary uh, Hughes and, and Mary McCormick because they're they're leaders. They were leaders before the pandemic. They were leaders in their communities for a lifetime, and this is great recognition for them. And we're going to need leaders like this now and in the future as we start to socialize again. And we know that everybody does that at a different rate. And leaders like uh, these five great islanders will be there to help people live well and live healthy and get and get together. So I'd like to compliment the minister, compliment the, the, the seniors for winning these awards. Well deserved. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 15 years ago, at a high school in Nova Scotia, students took action when their classmate was bullied for wearing a pink shirt. They stood together in unity and wore pink shirts to show support for their classmate. Their act of kindness created a powerful message. Bullying would not be tolerated in their school. This went on to inspire a global movement to take a stand against bullying. We need to continue to come, come together as a province to stand against bullying. School should be a place where children feel safe, cared for, and accepted. This is essential to the students' growth and development, both academically and socially. Schools are helping to create more welcoming and inclusive environments, initiatives such as the Gender and Diversity Guidelines, Safe and Caring Learning Environments Policy, and our student well-being teams, to name a few. I encourage communities across the island to take a stand together to ensure that we continue to foster environments in our schools where people are treated with the respect, compassion, and dignity they deserve. Schools throughout the public schools branch and Commission Scolaire de la Langue Française are celebrating Pink's Shirt Day today with various activities including classroom discussions, literacy themes on bullying, videos, virtual presentations, school-based projects. At Elm Street Ele Elementary School, they are having a virtual assembly to name their school mascot, the Eagle. And even the Eagle will be wearing a pink shirt today. And at Sherwood School, one of the five, uh, grade five classes is taking the lead and doing a virtual presentation for the entire school about kindness and being in, as inclusive as a rainbow. And this morning, I had the opportunity to visit both Parkdale Elementary and Stone Park Intermediate Schools. Many of the staff and students wore their pink shirts, scarves, and hats, and all sorts of different attire, and shared with me the importance of, of increasing awareness about ensuring we have safe, caring, respectful, inclusive schools across our province. Porter du rose aujourd'hui et de souligner l'importance d'avoir les écoles sécuritaires, bénévolantes, respectueuses et inclusives partout à Lille. I'm wearing my pink today to show my support, and I remind members of this house and all Islanders that we each have a role to play, not only today, but every day, and do what we can to prevent bullying and to spread kindness. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It really is a pleasure to stand up and speak to this statement, and I thank the Minister for bringing it forward. The impacts of bullying are profound. And unfortunately, I think a lot of us, when we were in school, it wasn't well recognized, the huge and profound impact that bullying actually has on, on people who are facing it. I feel like that was more pressed aside when we were growing up than it is now, and I think it's important that society has recognized the serious harm that bullying actually is for students. We know that bullying causes distress, loneliness, anxiety, depression. It causes people to feel their sense of self changing. I could go on and on about this. You know, the impacts of bullying can last a lifetime for people. And as a society, as, as I said, I think we have done a better job of understanding that, but I'm not entirely convinced that our policies and our laws have caught up with that shift in our societal understanding. You know, I'm not really convinced that they're yet adequate. There are some federal laws that some bullying could be captured under, but when you talk to people who are experiencing it, an awful lot of it is not captured. And wearing a pink shirt is a wonderful, positive symbol of compassion and support, and I welcome it. But as lawmakers, we actually have the ability to go one step further. 
Talk to anyone who is dealing with this nightmare and they will tell you that there are gaps that pink sh shirts alone won't fill. That's why I'm working on anti-bullying legislation, Mr. Speaker, that I hope to introduce in the House later this year. Based on all the pink that I see in the House, I hope that's a good sign that there'll be a lot of support for it when it does come to the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From Charlottetown, West Royalty, third party house leader. Well, let's uh, thank, thank the minister again for uh, that statement on uh, the importance of Pink Shirt Day. And I think it is important and it's a, it's a, it is a symbol, but we do have work to do. And um, we, have, we have a lot of issues that we didn't see uh, 10 or even 15 years ago with the access to social media and how, how people are able to communicate and potentially get into those streams to bully somebody else. So that will be an, a topic that we have to work on. Um, this is a nice symbol, but we do have a lot of education and a willingness to change and, and to look at the words uh, discrimination and diversity guidelines and, and inclusion and really figure out what that means. And, um, you know, again, I had a, recently gone out to, to speak to the amazing kids at Bluefield uh, High School for two leadership classes in grade 12. And incredible talking about diversity and inclusion and race. And they have the answers. They have the answers. The kids have the answers to this. And they have once again become leaders to help us out with this. So I think we need to celebrate them today and say thanks for wearing your shirts. We are following your lead. And um, we, we have to stop bullying in Prince Edward Island. And we're hopefully well on our way to doing that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism, and Culture. Mr. Speaker, undoubtedly the last couple months on top of the last couple years have been a tough go for Prince Edward Island's accommodation sector. But now, with travel measures easing, people are feeling ready to travel again, and it's looking to be a very promising tourism season this year. Mr. Speaker, last spring, together, Tourism PEI, the Hotel Association of PEI, and Food Island Partnership launched a new gift card initiative program. The goal of the program was to encourage guests to book qualifying PEI accommodations, and in return, they would receive a Canada's Food Island gift card. We saw such great success with this program that we just knew we had to bring it back, Mr. Speaker. So today, we're pleased to relaunch the gift card incentive program. The incentive will run from May 1st to June 15th, or while gift card qu quantities last. Upon check-in for a consecutive two-night stay, guests will receive a $100 Canada Food Island gift card, up to a maximum of two gift cards for a stay of four or more consecutive nights. Registration for the program is now open. PEI accommodation operators who are interested in participating in the program or want to learn more can visit PrinceEdwardIsland.ca slash TAAP. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it absolutely has been an incredibly difficult time for our tourism and accommodation sector, there's no doubt. Um, so looking at innovative solutions for how we can support this sector moving forward is certainly a positive thing to do. Uh, looking at, uh, at this program uh, being in place again, I think one of the interesting things is, is that it's focused on that shoulder season, and I, I think that certainly is, is a positive thing to do to expand our, uh, our tourism season and, and encourage uh, visitors to the island you know, beyond those, those strict summer months. So I do hope that it does encourage uh, people to want to come to visit our island, to visit it safely and um, uh, you know that there could be some certainly some positive impacts for that sector. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We all know how difficult and damaging uh, the pandemic was here to the island tourism uh, industry and the hospitality industry here on Prince Edward Island. Um, there isn't an industry on Prince Edward Island that hasn't been impacted uh, during this pandemic. Um, Island business who were, businesses who are part of the tourism uh, industry have seen um, just a, almost a stop to, uh, to their businesses for two years, and for an entire two years, actually. So, Minister, overall, I think this is a, is a good initiative uh, to, to relaunch, uh, to attract tourists here to the shoulder season. Um, could it go a little further? I, I think so. I, I believe it can, because if I understand correctly, the program um, seems to be aimed to off-island visitors, 
um, to come here to Prince Edward Island for a vacation. But I'd like to see the same um, gift card program to Islanders, be available to Islanders so they can go and see different parts of the island and uh, um, vacation here and support local small businesses right here in Prince Edward Island. So again, it, it is a good initiative. I just would like to see, if I am correct in that, that it's only open to off -island, uh, people from off the island, that maybe you could go back and maybe include Islanders into that. Thank you. End of minister statements. <laughs> Presentation and receiving petitions. <laughs> Tabling of documents. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a statement from the PEI Coalition for Supported Decision Making, which outlines their concerns with Bill Number 49, the Supported Decision Making Agreement Act. And I move, seconded by Charlottetown Victoria Park, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Charlotte Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Victoria Park. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table um, the House on Food and Security in Canada early in the COVID-19 pandemic from Statistics Canada. And I move seconded by the member from Mermaid Stratford that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Carry. Thank you. Joy? Is that one? The Honourable Clerk. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 80K of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly, a number of documents were tabled intercessionally. They were circulated to members via email and will be included in the journals for the day. Shall I carry? Carry. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table um, a uh, study on um, long term cardiovascular outcomes for COVID 19. And I move, seconded by Charlottetown Brighton, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Charlotte Carey. 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 Do I miss anyone on? Oh, oh. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Sorry, and then so distracted. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table global prevalence of post acute sequelae of COVID 19, PASC, or long COVID, a meta analysis and systemic review. And I move, seconded by Charlottetown Brighton, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Charlotte Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table um, documents referenced during QP today regarding housing, housing market correction, um, speculation and uh, response required. And I move, seconded by Charlottetown Brighton, that the said documents be now received and do lie on the table. Charlotte Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table an excerpt from the Chief Public Health Office report from 2021. It talks about the importance of the physical environments of your home, as well as the importance of having uh, good, clean air for good, clean health. And I move seconded by the member from Summerside Wilmot that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Should I carry? Carry. Miss, no? Reports by committees. Introduction of government bills. Motions other than government. The Honourable Member for Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask that motion 84 be now called. Shall I carry? Carry. Matthew, can I get the podium? Can I get the podium? Motion 84. The member for Mermaid Stratford moves, second the second advisory of the Opposition, to the following motion. Whereas nursing staff, RCWs, LPNs, and RNs are the foundation of our healthcare system in PEI. And whereas many of the negative effects felt in this pandemic are directly due to a shortage of nursing staff. And whereas burnout is growing among nurses and they are in need of government supports both in the short term and long term. And whereas increasing staff numbers while also offering career progression options for our current nursing staff may significantly significantly increase retention as well as demonstrate our gratitude to these professions. And whereas immediately providing free education to Islanders who want to enter the healthcare field as RCWs will increase our nursing support in the short term. 
and whereas government can then work with education institutions to provide an accelerated program for current RCWs to upskill to LPNs free of charge with a return for service agreement. And whereas government can then work with educational institutions to provide an accelerated program for current LPNs to upskill to RNs free of charge with a return for service agreement. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to provide free and accelerated training for nursing staff on PEI to enter the health care system and upskill their expertise. I'll call upon the mover of the motion to start debate, the Honourable Member for Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Nurses are the foundation of our health care system. If you've ever spent time in a hospital with a loved one or yourself, um, that becomes cl uh, incredibly clear. Uh, I have not actually been in the hospital for a long stay myself, but I do remember the time when I had my daughter. And, um, you know, when you're in the hospital, you're usually in there because you're sick or because you're under stress. And, and I remember having Ava, and this is 12 years ago, and, um, we were close to delivery, but I, then we found out that the, that the um, umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck. And at that point in time, Mr. Speaker, you know, all you're thinking of as a new mom is, you know, you've got to push. It's, it's time. And you're in a very stressful period. And the one thing I do remember of that night um, was the nurse that was in, with, in labor and delivery with me, Cheryl Verho, I still, I still remember her very clearly leaning forward to me and saying, you just need to listen to my voice. You just need to stop pushing. And that was the only voice I heard at that moment. And when everything around you is completely chaotic and you have lost control of a situation, to have somebody like that that has such high professionalism and such a high skill level to carry you through that moment was unbelievable. She just said to me, you just need to stop and you just need to listen to my voice. And I still so clearly hear Cheryl's voice whenever I think about the day that Ava was born. Fortunately, she was you know, healthy. They took care of the situation. We continued. It was a great birth. It was a wonderful moment for us all. And I'll be forever grateful to Cheryl Burho as the nurse that was in labor and delivery that night. I can also speak so highly of all of the nursing staff that took care of us when my dad was, was sick and in the hospital, especially when he moved to palliative care and the incredible staff that works in the palliative care unit. And Mr. Speaker, what we often see is um, nurses working just so hard. And the education of our residential care workers, our licensed practical nurses, our registered nurses, it's intensive and it's expensive. Um, you're expected to work, work long shifts, you, uh, be available 24-7 and 365 days of the year, particularly now when we have such shortages in our workforce. Mr. Speaker, I've heard from so many nurses who find such satisfaction in their jobs. And I've spoken to so many Islanders that speak so highly about the healthcare workers that we have working here in PEI. We ask a lot of our nurses. Um, you know, they struggle deeply with the workload and with the mental stress that comes with it. Um, another friend um, that uh, I heard from recently um, was going through the passing of a long-term care resident that he had been looking after for a very long time and he said you know some of the hardest days are when you know that they're at their end at the end and we are so fortunate that we have them there working with um, our loved ones every single day we ask a lot of our nurses but I fear that we don't get back enough um, I can not count the number of times that the Minister of Health or even the Premier have used excuses as to why we're, nurses are, remain understaffed, overworked and undervalued. It's COVID's fault. This was an issue long before COVID arrived, though. Other provinces are dealing with the same shortages and challenges, but that's not an excuse. We should find a way and do better. We shouldn't abandon our, abandon our island nurses. Some nurses work for private companies and we have no control over that. Well, you allowed parts of, health, of our health care system to be handed over to private companies.
but what you still but you still set out the terms and conditions for their fair treatment for the fair treatment of nursing staff there are a lot of different ways that we can support our nurses we've put forward a few ideas that this government has yet to take us up on and they don't seem to be coming anytime soon we ask for childcare spaces on hospital grounds we ask for COVID bonuses to be given to all frontline healthcare staff. We've asked for upskilling options for our nurses, but time and time again, all we get is excuses of why this can't happen. Today, I want to talk about options that this government has. Sorry, today I want to talk about options that this government has to provide education options for uh, for nurses on PEI. We have a se severe lack of nursing staff at all levels. Last fall, the C uh, last fall, the CEO of Health PEI confirmed that there's 700 vacancies in PEI healthcare system. And we heard from the president of the nurses union that 305 of them are with registered nurses. Mr. Speaker, we have outlined a plan that if we were government, we would consider and work towards implementing. The overall theme of the plan is that if you are an Islander and you want to be in nursing, it shouldn't cost you a dime. Mm -hmm. It would begin with immediate investment into the RCW training. Islanders could apply to the RCD, RCW program and receive free training if they sign a return for service agreement with the province. This would not fix all, this, all the solution, but it would put individuals into the RCW program and remove financial barriers for them. Do you know it costs $7,000 to be certified as an RCW and you're barely paid over minimum wage? That's crazy. How long does it take to pay back that student loan? Mm -hmm. While this is happening, we would work with educational institutions in PEI to create an accelerated program for experienced RCWs to upskill to LPNs. Again, with a return to service um, contract, experienced RCWs could take this training at no cost to them. This is a retention approach that is twofold. First, it gives our RCWs career progression, something that most people, especially young people, want. Professional development is important, and when our employers invest in employees, it helps improve employee uh, engagement. It increases retention and it attracts elite candidates. Most individuals in our generation and after don't want to work in the same job for 40 years. And we should harness that drive and ambition. It also invests in Islanders who have experience in healthcare, who have ties to PEI and have roots established here. There is a good chance that these Islanders are going to stay and they're going to thrive, but we have to invest in them. The next step is, a sim is to provide similar accelerated program for LPNs to upskill to registered nurses. My colleague, the member from Time Valley, Time Valley Sherbrooke and the former health critic has spoken at length in this house about the benefits of creating a two plus two program. This is an accelerated program for LPNs to become RNs that is available in other provinces. Many LPNs have reached out to our office because they want to upskill to become an RN, but that would mean that they'd have to start back at year one with no acknowledgement of the skills that they currently have. They'd have to go through the four years of education, not to mention the costs to these individuals who are already experienced in many aspects of healthcare to obtain training quicker, and if government covered the cost, it would also remove that financial barrier that many LPNs struggle with, because I remind you, we don't pay LPNs very well either. <clears throat> we have also heard that it's extremely difficult to get into the Faculty of Nursing. There are limited spots, and it is heavily weighted on academic performance. We recognize that academic performance is important, but there's also other characteristics that nurses that nurses have that are so vitally important. In a nurse, through work experience as being in RCW and LPN, their skills and dedication need to be recognized. We would also invest in the clinical component of all aspects of this plan. Today, nurses are asked to mentor students 
and this adds to their daily workload and it's a lot of stress. It's a lot to mentor um, students coming up in the system. But we don't pay them for that. Nurses particip participating in mentoring students need to be compensated for sharing their knowledge, their skills, and their experience. We don't expect teachers and other people, other professions to work for free, so why are we expecting our nurses to work for free? This approach gives nurses at all levels financial freedom and career progression. It gives dignity and respect to the profession, and it demonstrates just how important nurses are to our province in a very real way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague, Mermaid Stratford, for uh, firstly for moving the motion and also for those poignant and eloquent remarks. Beautifully, beautifully done. When you love something, you invest in it, you care about it, you, you want to see it grow and thrive, and that, that could be a relationship, it could be your garden, it could be your occupation, your work. It could be a loved antique car. There's a million ways that you can express your love and your care. But when you truly value something, you want, it to, you want to see it grow and you want to see it thrive. And unfortunately, all of the signs here on Prince Edward Island are that we do not value and care about our nurses. And this, is not, this motion is not just about getting more nurses and churning them through a system. It's about valuing those nurses, making them feel like they are truly cared for and loved and appreciated and valued for the incredibly important work that they do. I've had the privilege in my previous life of working with nurses in many situations, in ORs, in my dental office, in emergency situations. And there's one constant that I have seen in literally every nurse that I have worked with. And it's a, an ability to be compassionate, to be, to be caring, to be truly, deeply, sincerely, authentically concerned about the person or the people that they are treating. And I mean, I'm fortunate enough to be married to an RN and is uh, one of those kind, caring, compassionate people. And she displays that in all areas of her life. But I think she's a very typical nurse in many ways. And the birth of our children, um, Mermaid Stratford talked about the experience that she had during her birth and what was really potentially a very traumatic and dangerous situation was, was calmed down and it was supported and it was facilitated and cared for by a nurse. And I could talk about the birth of all of our children and, and the way that nurses and midwives were able to guide myself and, and particularly my wife, of course, through, through that time. But this government does not seem to understand that people who do this job, this very difficult job, absolutely a rewarding job, um, but a difficult job, that those people need to be supported, they need to be cared for, they need to be valued. And this government is consistently not listening to nurses and healthcare workers on the front lines. And I, I think back a couple of years ago now to when the mobile mental health units were being implemented. There were police, there were no police. It was going to be publicly run, it's going to be privately run. It's a moving target. We just never knew what was going on. And caught in the middle of this incredibly um, impactful and dynamic situation were nurses who were obviously part of those teams, part of the mental health mobile units. And I, I think about how difficult that must have been to not know the, the context of the work that you were going to be doing, nor the partners with which you were going to be doing it. Incredibly difficult work, incredibly challenging work. And so what made it even more upsetting was the fact that the PEI Nurses Union, the, the organization that acts as the voice for those frontline nurses, wasn't even spoken to or they weren't, they weren't consulted with during that time. And that's, 
That's not valuing nurses. That's not loving nurses. That's, that's disrespectful. When long-term care staffing issues were discussed in committee just a couple of weeks ago, I was again surprised and, and <laughs> extremely disappointed to hear that nobody there was tasked with talking to the nurses on the front line to identify the concerns they have, the unsafe working conditions that they have, the uncaring situations that they sometimes find themselves in. Nurses were not being spoken to. They were not being respected. They were not being valued. They were not being cared for. And since I've taken a seat in this house, I've heard from nurses who want to increase their education. And Mermaid Stratford talked a little bit about the efforts um, of another of my colleagues um, from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke to get the 2 plus 2 course in place so that LPNs can move on to become RNs. And of course, we need both. We need many LPNs, and we need many RNs. And full disclosure, I, um, my son Sam, his partner Katie, is currently an LPN here on Prince Edward Island, working in the QEH operating room, upgrading to become an RN. And she can't do that here on PEI. She has to do it by correspondence with a university outside our province while she's working full time in the OR as an, an RN here on Prince Edward Island. We don't make it easy. We're not valuing our nurses. We're not caring for our nurses. We are not loving our nurses. Another bit of full disclosure, and I'm going to give government credit for this. Um, my son Sam, who I just referenced, and his partner Katie, um, he is about to embark on an RCW program here on Prince Edward Island this fall. Uh, he's a chef, actually, but um, he really wants to enter into the RCW world and to look after elderly people. And a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I sent him some information on a microcredit course here in Hol being offered by Holland College, a six-week online course with a subsequent 280 hours of, uh, of in-person training, um, which can be done in a community care home or a long-term care home. And at the end of that, you get a microcredit towards your RCW, and you also get some financial help, that $7,000 that my colleague just described. Um, and my son just embarked on this program, and he's loving it. So thank you to the province for helping to fund that. Thank you to Holland College for making that opportunity available to encourage people to get in to our healthcare system, because my goodness, we need so many healthcare workers right now. So for years, myself and my team here have put forward solutions to some of the challenges faced by um, having enough workers, healthcare workers in our system. And, and this motion alone is not going to fix that. Sort of like the housing situation here on Prince Edward Island. It's not just one thing that's, that's going to fix it. Yes, we need to build public housing. Yes, we need to regulate STRs. Yes, we need to encourage investment in other forms of living. Yes, we need to zone for tiny homes. And there's a, 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 there's a, a thousand different things we do in order to overcome the housing crisis that we have, and that's true of health care as well. This motion alone is not going to do it, but if we were to start valuing our nurses, as I feel we absolutely have to, then it's part of the foundation to turn this around and get our health care system back on its feet again. We need leaders in this province, health care leaders, who don't just stand up and, and, and call health care staff heroes which of course they are, and particularly over the last two years they have been. We need leaders, we need leaders healthcare leaders in this province who will put money, their money where their mouth is. And I'm calling on this Premier and this Minister of Health and Wellness to act now. Do something to support our nurses, value our nurses, care for our nurses, love our nurses. They need it and they absolutely deserve it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We keep standing in this legislature to thank and show our appreciation for civil servants 
whom we have leaned on significantly, never more so than during this pandemic. And I'll take this opportunity to thank them again for getting up and doing and going to work for Islanders every single day, despite the fact that the system of which they are a part of is broken and there seems to be little will to make the changes needed to make their work lives better, healthier and safer for them and for those they serve. We stand and say thank you and then we continue on with our work and lives. I would like to see us stand and say thank you and here is how we want to show you we appreciate you. We have asked you what needs to change. We have asked you to share your ideas, thoughts, concerns for the future of your work. We have heard you. And here is how we are going to show you we have listed. We are doing this, this, and that. Thank you for going above and beyond. But alas, we never seem to do that. Some say gender equity is the only way forward if we are to truly make this world a better, safer, healthier, more equitable place for everyone. It is not lost on me as I consider the fact that professions that are predominantly represented by men, there are steps, opportunities to move up the ladder, so to speak. Nursing, which is in general made up of women, much like in childcare where we face many similar challenges, there are no steps, very little opportunity for advancement. This is easily something that we can shrug off and deny, but if we do not reflect on these things, and make the connections, we will never get to the root of these issues, which means it will never get better. When are we as a legislative assembly going to respond appropriately? Because it can get better. It can get way better when there is both understanding and political will. The minister responsible for both the status of women and education and lifelong learning has a unique challenge and great opportunity here so to stand up, use her voice and authority to make these changes which are so desperately needed. She has the opportunity to, sit, to stand and say, I know you are short staffed, I know you are burning out at increasing rates, I know you are in need of supports, I have heard you and I value you, so our government is going to increase staff numbers offer career progression op options to you because we appreciate you and we have heard you and we want to show our commitment to retention. We are going to offer free education to those entering the resident care worker field because we know this will help the health care field in the short term. Then we are going to work with educational institutions on educational upskilling options with return for service agreements. We value you. We want you to stay on the island. We hear you and we thank you through these actions. If we truly value them, we need to put our money where our mouths, where our mouths are and stop just talking about it because as the old saying goes, actions speak louder than words. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I, I rise today and I certainly uh, support this motion, Mr. Speaker. Um, Back when I was 23 years old, I, uh, I had open heart surgery, and it was a very scary time for me at a, a young age, Mr. Speaker. And I remember uh, the nurses in uh, in uh, Halifax at the time, and uh, just what they've done to me to, to calm me down and uh, and get me through uh, seven days in the hospital. And they went above and beyond, uh, as I've seen a lot of nurses do, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when my twins were were born, um, they're four and a half years old now. To watch uh, what the nurses have done and really how much they've cared uh, to, to, to help us through that time and uh, I certainly give, give my hats off to them because uh, they go above and beyond. Uh, one that really hits home here and this uh, just happened here within the last couple of months Mr. Speaker but uh, a good friend of mine uh, had passed away of, of cancer and uh, he was in the hospital for quite some time and the nurses uh, would do whatever they could to take that little extra step, um, make sure that he was comfortable, um, really do, do everything they could, but uh, one thing they done one day, uh, my, my friend had a, has a, has a two-year-old daughter, and uh, she was in there quite, quite often, and the nurses uh, uh, come in with some toys one day for her and really done everything they could to keep that child uh, with the last days of their father. And it, uh, it really hit home to me of, uh, of just how great of a job nurses and doctors do in this province, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'll certainly do whatever I can to, uh, to support, uh, support nurses, uh, Mr. Speaker. 
quite often uh, I meet with the Federation of Labour and obviously different issues and topics come up and I'm always a voice that goes back and uh, and uh, gives gives uh, information to our cabinet because uh, there's a lots of things that are happening out there that uh, even in the seats we're in Mr. Speaker that uh, uh, they're just not communicated to us so we try and work we try and work through that uh, the, the best we can uh, I'm very grateful for my department uh, uh, the skills department for all the initiatives they've done they've worked with uh, with help health, health PEI and Mr. Hudson's department department to really roll out some great programs on uh, on getting uh, nurses and uh, and uh, uh, health care uh, providers uh, into into the workforce and, and create a path forward so there's lots of work happening behind the scenes mr. speaker I know we probably don't do a good enough job explaining and letting uh, the public know what's going on but uh, I'm sure Minister Husband or Hudson will, will say a few words about that but uh, once again I certainly support this motion I, uh, I thank all nurses for everything you've done for me and my family and and my friends and I'm very grateful to uh, to have you here in PEI thank you mr. speaker Health Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank uh, uh, the MLA and the leader of the opposition across the floor here for bringing this forward. I know it is easy to stand and pay lip service, if you like, to all of our workers, whether they're in health care, whether they're in education. Or, uh, or any department, or even in the private sector, uh, Mr. Speaker. You hear the comments that, uh, that my colleague, uh, Minister of uh, Economic Growth and Tourism, just brought forward, and I think it's one of the things when we have the opportunity and the privilege to stand, Mr. Speaker, in this legislature, one of the things that really uh, impacts me the most is when I hear those personal comments. And I thank you for your comments uh, earlier on this motion. I thank uh, the Minister of Economic Growth and Tourism uh, for his as well. Think back uh, to when I was, I guess, about uh, six years old, thereabouts, and had to go in for emergency surgery. And back at that point in time, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I know that there have been changes, there have had to be changes made right across the province, but as to where uh, certain procedures were provided at. But I think back to that time, uh, just a few years ago, but uh, having to go in, and it was at Western Hospital, and they were still doing surgeries at Western at that point in time, Mr. Speaker. And the care as a six-year-old that I received from the nursing staff and from uh, right, right across. But uh, I can recall being wheeled in to surgery. And I'll be honest, six years old, you don't know what's going on. I was petrified. I'm sure I was. I know I was, Mr. Speaker. But there were these two nurses there. And they were the kindest, most caring, as we know, right across the board with our nursing staff, but that is the type of thing, Mr. Speaker, that stood out and continues to stand out for me, that these two relatively young nurses at that point in time, how caring they were and their ability to calm me down in a situation that, uh, that I didn't really know at that age what was, uh, what was taking place. Uh, certainly was uh, blessed to be able to have my parents there with me prior to going into the OR. But on that uh, trip down the hall, yes, it was, uh, it was scary. And it, that's just an example. Uh, I think of, of the home care services, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we have across the province. The nurses and... Uh, uh, in particular, and I certainly will not uh, will not use this home care nurse's uh, name, but my dad, who lives at home by himself at 103 years of age, and I am so blessed to to have him and to have uh, at that age to have. 
the abilities that he still maintains, Mr. Speaker. But going back to the home care nurse, like uh, in the home care program overall, but he got his first COVID vaccination, his second one, and his booster, all of them at home with a home care nurse coming in. And she was so caring, so compassionate with this very elderly man. He was so, so relaxed, so comfortable. And then she stayed, she stayed for 20, and I know that there's a certain length of time that uh, under requirements, regulations, Mr. Speaker, that they do have to stay. But I know that she stayed longer than that. She had a great chat. She uh, had roots in the West Prince area, although uh, she didn't live there, uh, or doesn't live there at this point in time, Mr. Speaker. But the discussion, the chats that she had with Dad about family members, about how, and my dad worked at uh, carpentry work for a lot of years, and her grandfather had worked, and it was a different firm, but he had worked at carpentry work as well. And the discussion, the chats that they had uh, on that, uh, as well, her grandfather had owned at one point in time a small firm, did, and myself subsequently, but we firmed, and discussions those types of personal interactions that are so important, and I know that we see that time in and time out with regard to our nursing staff, Mr. Speaker. I know that the question of human resources and health care, without a doubt, it is one of the most pressing ones right across the board, uh, and at pretty well every level, Mr. Speaker, whether it's our physicians, whether it's our specialists, whether it's our nurses, our LPNs, our RCWs, I could go on and on. And one of uh, the privileges that I have had since coming into this position, into uh, position as Minister of Health and Wellness, is to be able to have those discussions with other health ministers, both uh, the federal minister and my, uh, my colleagues in uh, the provinces and territories, and here, some of the uh, challenges that they are having, some of the massive challenges. Uh, the last FPT meeting that I was on, uh, one, of, uh, uh, one of the health ministers uh, from one of the territories said that they had not been able to provide any OBGYN services since the 1st of December. Mr. Speaker, since the 1st of December, and the impact that that was having on that minister's residence, and just, and how, I'll be honest, how it was impacting that minister as well, as that jurisdiction struggled to try and get uh, OBGYNs into the territory. So it's not unique to PEI, but that, Mr. Speaker, that does not in any way, shape, or form downplay the importance of it here in this province and the initiatives that we have taken with regard to recruitment, with regard to retention, uh, and going back to uh, uh, FPT calls, and I believe I had mentioned it here in the legislature yesterday, Mr. Speaker, that with regard to uh, committee FPT meetings that have just started very recently addressing that human health resources and how we can work together with the federal government but collectively across the provinces to move forward to be able to address that. I've had uh, conversations with, uh, and the mo with provincial counterparts of ILAT, uh, most recent was uh, with uh, the Minister of Health from Newfoundland, Mr. Speaker, earlier this week. And we have to look, uh, one of the comments that was made in, at this point in time, we certainly we do need incentives to recruit and to retain health care workers. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we always have to be wary, we have to realize, okay, if uh, as a jurisdiction, 
if PEI puts our incentives up to a certain level, Nova Scotia goes a little higher, New Brunswick a little higher, Newfoundland a little higher, we go a little higher. Like, it's a never-ending cycle, and we have to work together. What does that mean? Until they're paid well. Pardon? Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is. It's, uh, it's that cycle. And I don't disagree like, uh, with regard to the payment, the remuneration of our health care professionals. Certainly. But everyone in this House, and certainly uh, uh, former minister across my uh, good friend and colleague uh, on the other side of the House, he has seen the challenges of this. And I know that we have our back and forths, and, uh, but uh, he does, uh, you know, I know that he put his best foot forward. He did his absolute best over that two-year period, and uh, which, you know, I, I will too and am doing that. But there are challenges there, Mr. Speaker. There's the collective bargaining processes and the like that we do have to, to adhere to and uh, to go through. But anyway, Mr. Speaker, just uh, I've been ad-libbing a fair bit here, uh, but to go back to some of the notes that I do have, you know, our system, it is only as strong as the skilled and the devoted workers that we do have here in this province that deliver health care. And our first approach often is and has been to recruit immediately to fill our most pressing needs. And the recruitment and retention of registered nurses to help PEI, we have, we have worked hard on that. Our staff, my staff, have worked extremely hard on that. You look at uh, the recruitment numbers over, uh, over the last year with regard to uh, the RN program, Mr. Speaker. Uh, over that time period, 24 experienced RNs, 89 graduate RNs. The nurse referral program, Mr. Speaker, that was uh, announced here a short time ago, there have been 10 referrals, there have been two hires through that program, and there are two additional ones that, uh, that are in the process, that overall process of, uh, of being hired, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, yes, it is, and I know it's easy to, to give lip service uh, to it, Mr. Speaker, but it, it certainly it is. It's a priority. Uh, you look, though, it's, it's certainly, it's not just nurses, as I had mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker. It's also the other, the other providers in our health care system that we have to make sure are all working as a team, Mr. Speaker, whether it's our specialists, whether it's our family docs, nurses, LPNs, RCWs. And that is why we have to look at the bigger picture, the broad picture as well, with regard to recruitment and uh, retention. But uh, for the moment, I will speak uh, with regard to recruitment. Uh, the incentives that are offered for our physicians, Mr. Speaker, for our specialists, when there's a need that's identified, we have stepped up to the plate to provide incentives to, to bring individuals, to bring professionals here. Uh, the most recent example, <coughs> excuse me, of that, Mr. Speaker, is putting in the $15,000 incentive for psychologists. And Mr. Speaker, the, the complement for psychologists within the province of Prince Edward Island is 13. Over the last, uh, and I would have to go back, so, but I believe it's over about the last five to six months since that incentive was put in place, Mr. Speaker, there have been five new psychologists recruited to the province of PEI. And it's one of the advantages that we do have as a small province as well. Some of those individuals, Mr. Speaker, who were looking at coming to PEI, I was able, as minister, to meet individually with them and to have that discussion and to meet with them in addition to, uh, 
uh, you know, the individuals, uh, the staff that work uh, in recruitment, but the feedback they received from them was this would never happen if we were looking at going to Ontario or if we were looking at going to Quebec. And it really it meant something to them, Mr. Speaker, to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation and to hear from them as well, Mr. Speaker, in that case, in those cases. Okay, what, what are you looking at? What is really important to you as a health care provider when you're looking at an area to lo locate to? And uh, in this case, with a psychologist and uh, had a relatively young family, it wasn't just the work itself or the work environment. It was the other things that were in, uh, available in the greater community, Mr. Speaker, whether it was dance classes, whether it was sports, uh, and so on, uh, theater. So when they were here and they saw, for example, Confederation Center and the theater and had the opportunity to discuss with us just the, the plays that are put on there, things along that line. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, the same thing when we look at uh, the virtual reality recruitment tool that has been put in place in conjunction or in partnership between Health and Wellness, uh, the Medical Society, and our physician recruiter, Mr. Speaker. It has been, it's been successful, but it's that innovation of how we use, Mr. Speaker, that innovation of how we use technology uh, in the recruitment or can use it. And uh, I think some of uh, the members here, I do believe, had the opportunity to, uh, to view that uh, virtual reality recruitment process uh, up, uh, and, uh, up in Summerside here just before Christmas. Uh, and it was amazing. Really, in my opinion, it was truly amazing. Anybody who does have the opportunity to, uh, to give it a try, I would strongly recommend it. The other thing, though, I would strongly recommend is if you do, make sure that you're sitting down or else you'll probably be flat out on your back because it is so real. And when you turn your head, it's just uh, about 360 degree view that you do get. But uh, anyway, uh, with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, those are some of the tools that we have to use and will continue to use uh, as, we, uh, as we move forward. Uh, now, recruitment, uh, recent recruitment efforts, they've been focused as well, Mr. Speaker, on filling full-time, hard to recruit vacancies for for example, social workers, Mr. Speaker. I'd reference psychologists, uh, oh certainly God. psychiatry, which has been a major challenge over the years for recruitment. Adjourn debate, seconder. Okay, I'll adjourn debate. Thank seconder. you, Mr. Speaker. Seconder. Seconded by the social I, I Minister of Social Development and Housing. Honorable members, uh, debate has been adjourned. I'll call on the member from Charlottetown West Royalty and the third party house leader. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I call for first reading of an act to amend the property act. Should I carry? Carry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to uh, introduce a bill entitled an act to amend the Real Property Tax Act, and I move seconded by the Tignish uh, Palmer Road MLA that the, be now received and read the first time. Sean Carey. Bill number 123, an act to amend the Real Property Tax Act, read the first time. Overview, member. 
Mr. Speaker, this is a, an act to uh, amend the Real Property Tax Act to give the Minister of Finance uh, the power to waive any or all any portion of interest or penalties where the Minister is satisfied that uh, for circumstances beyond the control of the person against who interest was charged or a penalty uh, levied. It really is a response to what happened in my district where the postmaster sent back a lot of uh, property tax bills and those people all get hit with a, uh, uh, a late fee, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, government, third party, House Leader. Uh, if I could get the podium. For, um, and we'll call on motion number 80 at this time. Should I carry? carry. Motion number 80. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Verness moves, seconded by the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the following motion. Whereas the Prince Edward Island health care system has been under significant strain due to staffing shortages of registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, and resident, <coughs> resident patient care workers across all specialties, and whereas recruiting and retaining staff in the specialty of long-term care nursing is a challenge across many jurisdictions, including Prince Edward Island, and whereas the enhanced safety measures and protocols required due to the Jerry geriatric population's vulnerability for COVID caused additional workloads for long-term care staff resulting in increased levels of burnout and the further stretching of workloads being felt prior to the pandemic. And whereas government must prioritize increasing staffing resources in this specialty so to not further burden the staff remaining in this field and to ensure facilities are able to provide the highest standards of care to residents. And whereas a customized approach and collaboration with unions and other necessary stakeholders is required to market and attract professionals to work in the field. And whereas a key aspect of formulating a recruitment effort for long-term care will require consultation from existing staff on their perception and opinions of changes required to attract new staff. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to conduct a conduct a targeted and robust recruitment and retention strategy specifically for long-term care staffing for the wellness and safety of residents and staff. I'll ask the Honourable Member from Larry Inverness, third party whip, to start debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's been a while since I had the opportunity to speak to this legislature to talk about uh, various topics and uh, it's always good to ask questions, but I think sometimes it's, uh, it's important that we have a, a good debate and we raise various points of view when it comes to uh, issues that are important. And uh, I felt that, uh, you know, I've been following uh, the, what's been going on in the long-term care. I've had the opportunity to ask lots of questions to the Minister of Health. I've had opportunities to question uh, on legislative uh, committees as I sit on the Health uh, Committee. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to get a lot of the answers, Mr. Speaker, that I've been looking for. And uh, I feel it's important that, uh, you know, we do develop, uh, you know, a targeted recruitment strategy for long-term care, Mr. Speaker. So it's certainly a, a pleasure to have that opportunity to speak on this particular subject, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly know that we all know that staffing long-term care beds is an issue that is faced in multiple jurisdictions across the country. And it's not unique to PEI. I understand that. I've been the Minister of Health, and I, I take the, the challenge of stuff. But, uh, but when I look at a lot of the issues around long-term care, and uh, I took the opportunity just to recently look up uh, how many uh, vacancies there were just in the residential support positions, uh, which is, are mostly where some of the long-term care positions tend to be. Um, you know, we're talking uh, resident care workers, patient care workers. I mean, that's a 36-week course, Mr. Speaker for people to get the training, to have the quality uh, of competency to fulfill an obligation to look after what would mo mostly be our seniors. Uh, obviously, there's uh, some situations where we deal with people that have uh, disabilities and things of that nature. So this isn't something that, uh, you know, uh, takes years to do. I sort of get the issue, you know, when we talk about trying to recruit doctors and we try to create uh, medical schools, that's going to take years to get to the point where you need to be. But we're talking, you know, a course that you could get at Holland College or you could get at, uh, at uh, Margaret Connolly's uh, School of Nursing where we're talking 36 weeks, Mr. Speaker. So I think that's something that uh, needs to be sort of uh, identified and noticed in all of this. And I took the opportunity to look at the numbers and, uh, you know, we're talking here 76 positions that, uh, that are, if you take internal and external positions that are advertised on the Public Service Commission, 
Now, we have to add to that in the respect that we're talking a lot of private institutions, but also be looking at uh, resident care workers. And, uh, you know, so this, although daunting as it may sound, it is something that is relatively solvable if we, if we really put our so-called shoulder to the wheel, Mr. Speaker, and solve this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, sort of, I always sort of say, well, why didn't you do that when you were there? <laughs> well, it's been a while since I've been there, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I do recall keeping an eye on these numbers quite uh, diligently, and I remember making the comment here many times, when I was Minister of Health, you'd, you'd usually see advertisement on the Public Service Commission site about 20 vacancies for nursing positions. That, that would be including RNs and LPNs, Mr. Speaker. Today, it's like 140-some positions, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's, far, it's far different uh, in my, than in my time. And I've been watching those external vacancies pretty regularly. Every week, I check it, in fact. And you know, it's, it's always like 103, 106, 108, and you add in some internal positions. So you know, these are pretty significant numbers versus when my time was there, 20. And if I added RCW vacancies in my time, you might have one or two or three. It was never big numbers, Mr. Speaker. So when you're, when you're starting to look at 40, 50, 60, 70, these kinds of numbers, it, it would seem to me that we'd have to say that we have a government that's, that's lost control of the handle on how to develop a, a strategy to recruit people, retain them, keep them in their positions. And uh, you know that's, uh, that's uh, something that's incumbent. They've been in government now for, this is what, year three. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, they can get some of these things. And I know the lovely excuse, oh, it's a pandemic, and we can't do much of the pandemic. But, gee, I call my road supervisor to say, can we get somebody to clean a few ditches out? Well, we've got nobody working for us. They're all working at the COVID clinics, or, or they're out on pandemic leave. You know, so at some point in time, we have to provide services to the public that, that says we're a government. We deliver services to people that require it. We do it through, you know, uh, Rain, sleet, hail, <laughs> uh, bad weather, uh, fires. We, we have to deliver a sense of services. And you know, to go oh, two and a half years and say, oh, we can't do that, it, it, we got to come up with some solutions on this, Mr. Speaker. And as an MLA who represents an area that you know, long-term care uh, beds are uh, important to our area, and we have a significant number of long-term care beds. I have the Margaret Stewart Ellis uh, long-term care facility that's attached to the O'Leary Hospital and the O'Leary Health Center. And as I know the minister, we've met with uh, them uh, on, with the hospital foundation in the past. And, you know, they provide a wonderful service. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great facility. But if they're having staffing challenges, Mr. Speaker, that they can't deliver the services, or if we're turning around and we're reducing the amount of patient care that people are getting uh, uh, to get that level of service, you know, we had a health committee and we talked about, I think it was a member of Charlottetown, uh, West Royal here, somebody mentioned a comment about, you know, we can't even get the snow removed from the windows in front of long-term care beds, Mr. Speaker. The minister didn't seem to be too aware of that. Now, I'm not aware of any snow being removed, but we did get warmer weather, so I'll give the minister credit. We did get <laughs> spring starts to come, and, and the, the snow did get down below the, the yeah, so, uh, you know. <laughs> I guess the, I, I'll guess I'll say as a minister, it doesn't matter how it gets done, as long as it's done, right? So. <laughs> yeah, well, so uh, you know the climate change stuff. So maybe we should be letting that the things heat up a bit, so we don't have our snow quite so high, Mr. Speaker. But, but you know that that's that's the kind of response we're getting back. That's not a strategy. That's not a delivery of services, Mr. Speaker, to our, our elderly people who require, uh, you know, a little more respect and, and uh, support than that, Mr. Speaker. I also have a community care facility in my riding, Mr. Speaker, that hires RCWs, patient care workers, LPNs. That's the Lady Slipper Villa, Mr. Speaker. It's, a, it's part of a chain of Jason Lee and the Garden Home and a number of them, but it's in O'Leary. And, and, uh, you know, they also have staffing issues where sometimes they can't have all their beds opened. And, and you know, we've got patients and people that are calling. I get, I get a text here today from somebody that said, we've got to get this family into a community care facility. We've got to get them somewhere. They're, they're really not in a safe situation, Mr. Speaker. And, I, and I'm saying, well, you know, they have to make some effort or the family has to make some effort to deal with their situation. But 
but having a community care facility is important in your district. And I think even what's more you know, exciting than a response to try to deal with what we see as an aging infrastructure for our community care facilities uh, in our community, uh, we, there was a group being formed uh, called the, the Community Seniors Cooperative in O'Leary uh, Limited Group. And uh, they've been working on a new, brand new, 50-unit uh, community care facility for O'Leary. And they've got the location and they've got the sign up, which is always a good sign to get started. And it's now going to be called The Willows. And uh, it's going to be a 50-unit facility. And I know the minister's helped with that, so I, you know, I give credit to that. I'll say it's an idea that was eventually uh, fostered by myself as an MLA with a meeting with a number of citizens to say, oh. we have to deal with this issue. Yeah, oh yeah, I don't know. That, and, and we formed a committee, which I was part of trying to get this committee going, of which there's a, a number of people still on that. I want to give people like Sally Lockhart and Fran Lewis and John Martin uh, and Ronnie McWilliams, Jordan McDonald, a number of those people to, that we got together. And it's been a long road. And, uh, but we're now getting to a stage with the help mostly of the federal government, but also the provincial government, CMHC, and uh, now they've got a uh, you know, construction start date planned whenever the frost is out of the ground, and we'll hopefully in about a year, year and a half's time, we'll start to see uh, something there. But it's just, I just wanted to mention to the House that it's called The Willows, and uh, it was actually has a history of why the name The Willow, and it was named after uh, The Willow Hotel, which was very near the site. And it was operated in the late 1800s uh, in O'Leary. It was operated by uh, James Barkley and his wife. So, uh, so, you know, that's good creative thinking that they come up with a very unique and supportive name. And, uh, you know, so those are the types of things that I feel, Mr. Speaker, that are very, very important when we're trying to uh, deal with some stuff like this, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, the amount of long-term care beds we have in this province, we have a unique situation in Prince Edward Island in how we deal with long-term care beds. We have, at the moment, 1,268 long-term care beds designated in Prince Edward Island. I'm pretty sure you have a Colville Manors in your district, Mr. Speaker. Say, I have the Margaret Stewart Ellis Wing. Uh, we have Maplewood Manor in the Minister's District. And uh, uh, Le Chenu has beds in uh, the Wellington area, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, I've asked questions to the minister, how many beds are sitting empty? We have beds that are sitting empty in this province. We've got families that are having a hard time finding a, a place to uh, uh, send their loved ones and to try to provide support. I went through this with my family, Mr. Speaker, when uh, you know, both my dad and mom were having uh, some issues, uh, you know, based in, uh, on their uh, age. And uh, my mom had dementia, Alzheimer's, and uh, it's a challenge in trying to provide a level of care, and I guess uh, not to put anything on my sister, but I was the only one living on Prince Edward Island. My sister's in Ontario, and uh, you know that comes with the challenges. And boy, I tell you, I was pretty, pretty uh, relieved when finally, after a long time on the waiting list, my mom uh, eventually got into a long-term care bed. And she did provide uh, a fair, you know, wonderful care, the staff at the different facilities that she was at, because it is a process. If you uh, are fortunate enough to get one bed and stay there at that spot, that's pretty, pretty good. But I know in my mom's case, you know, she wound up uh, going to the Margaret Stewart Ellis and O'Leary. Uh, she was in respite in that particular case. Uh, then eventually got transferred to uh, Wedgwood Manor in Summerside before eventually getting to, uh, to where she uh, eventually passed away at, which was at uh, uh, Stewart Memorial Manor in Tyne Valley. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Here, we don't even have respite care, Mr. Speaker. There's been times through this, and maybe, maybe some of it's back now, but in lots of cases, no respite care. You know, I was some fortunate and, and happy to be able to access those services, Mr. Speaker. And that's the type of things that government has a responsibility to deliver on, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, so uh, when we get talking about uh, situations of uh, long-term care, like I said before, there are other jurisdictions that have these types of problems, Mr. Speaker. And like I said before, we might have, uh, you know, a couple hundred uh, nursing vacancies, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we start to look at uh, Nova Scotia. It has 450-some vacancies, Mr. Speaker. And you'd say, well, you know, Nova Scotia is doing uh, that. They're having a pretty tough over there. But let's start putting some of this into the equation of per capita, Mr. Speaker. It's 10 times bigger. 
So, you know, these are numbers that, that start to reflect how we are doing on Prince Edward Island. When you start putting that into the equation, you start to see what kind of competition we're going to be dealing with when we're trying to fill these positions, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you have to be able to compete in an a open marketplace where there's other Atlantic provinces that are having the same thing. At one time, Mr. Speaker, we used to be the best in Atlantic Canada for all our numbers, whether it was patient registry to vacancies uh, and uh, access to family doctors, all of those things, we were really good. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, those are things that we need to figure out, right, Mr. Speaker? And uh, so uh, when it comes to that, you have to put that into the equation on where we're at when it comes to, uh, to uh, how we compete in other provinces, Mr. Speaker. So I don't think the solution is necessarily, like the minister says, up and it's all about wages. I think that's a factor in it, without a doubt. Uh, you know, we have to be competitive in the marketplace. But I think we need a recruiting strategy that also deals with training local people so they can provide those positions and providing them with the supports that they can uh, uh, enjoy their job, look forward to going to work every day, and not be put in these types of stressful positions. I had a meeting the other day, because I brought some questions up uh, to uh, the minister at the health committee meeting regarding, uh, and I, I happened to, I thought I'd send him a, a copy of that uh, presentation, and he was quite uh, awestruck by the minister's comments uh, where about the situation of uh, working conditions that are so stressful that, you know, in this particular case, this person gave their job up, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, so, you know, that's why it's very important that we make sure that we're trying to uh, uh, make sure we're retaining our staff, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, so I, I thought I'd go out and have a little conversation with my constituent that uh, left the position. Now, I will say that he said he'd come back if the, if the conditions were right and things like that. So that's a good, you know, there's some situations like that. But, you know, I said, well, wh why did you leave? And his issue was simply, we're in unsafe protocols all the time. Unsafe protocols. And for everybody, I keep bringing it up time and time again. I asked questions yesterday. And in unsafe protocols, when your staffing complement falls below what's considered the safe level of care that you can deliver the service of what's four hours a, a day per patient, and the list goes on. And, uh, you know, he, he said, I, you know, I, I just didn't feel right trying to do a level of service. I'm running from one end of the building to the other. Uh, I can't deliver that service properly. And heaven forbid, if there's something that ever happens to a situation where things went, you know, went wrong, somebody passed away or somebody gets sick or somebody fell and you couldn't handle that, well, then that means there's an inquiry into what happened and what went wrong. There's a, a, a huge amount of paperwork that goes with that. So that's a pretty stressful work environment that goes into that. You know, and in this particular, you know, your situations can be where you have to be vaccinated or not vaccinated. You've got to be tested all these times. So it, it became, became quite a, a, a situation for that individual, for a person who was generally pretty good at his job and uh, enjoyed uh, working there. And I guess my understanding would go back if an opportunity exists. But, uh, uh, but that's, a, that's another, another story, Mr. Speaker. But, uh, you know, so I think when we start looking at... Uh, here in situations that we had to grant provisional licenses. You know, uh, I look at some of these other facilities, the Garden Home 127 bed facility, South Shore Villa 36 bed facility. And I've had people reach out to me uh, from those types of facilities saying they're concerned. And uh, if they're not meeting the basic level of standard of care, uh, you know, and we ask questions about inspections, are inspections being done regularly? And we hear that, uh, well, there were some phone inspections done. <laughs> You know, I would sort of be a little bit concerned about that, and, and, uh, and I'm sure the people that are working there are doing their very best, Mr. Speaker, and the ownership are doing their very best, Mr. Speaker, but that, these are the types of answers that we got back. And once again, the minister did not acknowledge these issues until after the director did, and that's, that, that's, that's concerning, Mr. Speaker, that the minister is not being informed of what's going on. I know my time as a minister, I don't want to say that we didn't have unsafe protocols back then too, Mr. Speaker. But I would get, you know, I was always notified that pretty well the day or the moment that, uh, that an unsafe protocol existed. And, uh, you know, you'd get a couple a month at a certain facility or a different facility. And those are things that, uh, you know, would certainly cause me uh, concern and worry. 
but uh, you know we did you know when I knew it was a shorter term thing, and I and I do recall the day when we got into a situation where uh, one facility seemed to have a uh, sequence of problems over a period of time, and we had to pull the license, Mr. Speaker. Not not a fun day. Staff had to work extremely hard to try to find uh, uh, another place for these people to go. And, uh, but these are tough, these are the tough decisions you have to do when you're in government. It's, it's, it's as a minister, you gotta do it. You can't, you can't allow people to be in unsafe conditions and situations where they're not, uh, uh, that you as a minister don't feel confident that people are getting the proper delivery of services, uh, you know, as, as such. And, uh, you know, so then to even add more to the equation, Mr. Speaker, we have a situation where Health PEI and this long-term care funding agreement has expired. You know, if you're really, you're really serious about this and you're working with your private facilities, Mr. Speaker, you would certainly try to do to make sure you get a deal that, uh, that makes some sense to them. Because in the end of the day, you're going you're gonna to pay. I mean, in the end of the day, there's going to be a negotiation. It'll probably be retroactive. So, uh, so let's get down. Make, let's make some tough decisions. Work out a deal, and let's uh, let's come to a consensus where these these uh, people can be paid appropriately, and so that the s delivery of services is going to be appropriate, Mr. Speaker. And that then sets the standards then for both our private facilities and our and our governmental facilities. Uh, you know, some of the stories I'm hearing, Mr. Speaker, of even in our government, and this, these are things that are happening in our government facilities. It's not, the Minister keeps referring to our private facilities that we don't control the hire and we don't control, but the Minister is responsible, he's, a, he's the inspector, his, his department inspects these sites, uh, and uh, he should be in the know to make sure that they are meeting a reasonable standard. I get it if there's a short situation where something pops up, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, that, you know, a staff person can't come in, but, you know, I've heard stories where they, where some staff just to keep compliment, they'd lock them in, their, they had COVID, so they, they got them to come into work and lock them in, a, in their office. So don't see a patient, don't go near, but at least it keeps us in a situation where we've, we we're not in an unsafe protocol. That's, that's, that's fudging things. That's, that's mixing things up, Mr. Speaker. That's not appropriate. It's, a sa it's the same thing as uh, it's the same thing as our private facilities. When facilities, when you, you know, I asked the question to the minister a number of times here about uh, the issues that were having, uh, you know, uh, keeping beds open, Mr. Speaker. And minister, oh, we're open. We got another 20 beds opening up, and then I find out they reduced the patient care hours <laughs> to meet the thing, to get the thing open. That's that's fudging the numbers again, Mr. Speaker. That's not being up front with people and letting us know. I'm okay with if you're saying that those hours have been reduced per patient and you're only going to get a sponge bath for a short period of time, but I'm hearing this is continuing and continuing on, Mr. Speaker. So we gotta we have to we have to get. Uh, serious about how we're going to provide services to our people in long-term care, Mr. Speaker. You know, uh, I guess we're kind of starting to look at, uh, you know, it's important to, to deal with these issues. We have to show respect to our, uh, our uh, current staff in our long-term care facilities that are government-run, provide our, our uh, community care facilities and long-term care facilities that have contracts with us to make sure that they're fulfilling their obligations. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm assuming people, these facilities are being paid like they normally would be paid, even though that they had to reduce their level of service. I, I can't confirm that, and maybe when the minister uh, speaks or the minister of finance, she's quite familiar with uh, community care facilities, long-term care beds and things of that. And, but, uh, you know, in the end of the day, we're paying for a service. We need to get a reasonable response back. And, uh, you know, I think we all can agree that when we get older, our goal is to certainly age in place. We'd love to, I hope to do that at my home. But my dad and mom probably thought the same thing, but it got to the point where my mom, it just, we couldn't do it. That's where we need our, our community care and long-term care facilities that are providing that service and uh, allow that to happen. So, so I, cer I certainly can say, Mr. Speaker, that uh, Time comes that we have to utilize long-term care services, that the facilities which we eventually become our home are staffed accordingly, they're clean and able to provide services for our physical and mental and spiritual well-being. It's only a reasonable expectation as I see it, Mr. Speaker, but unfortunately we can't say that that's been happening recently, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, so I certainly want to be clear you know, that, uh, you know, these unpleasant stories that we're hearing, I know that's not necessarily because of the staff, 
because the, the system hasn't been set up to make sure that we're <coughs> recruiting people, that we're providing them the proper training and allowing them to deliver and fulfill their full scope of practice, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, I, I can think of situations uh, in my time we used to have RCW courses. I can remember there's one in O'Leary. We had a, an LPN course in O'Leary. And, you know, I used to have some pretty tough arguments with, uh, with my colleagues in Cabinet uh, to say why we should be doing that. And here's the reason, Mr. Speaker. You've got to remember where people live in Prince Edward Island. They're all in rural areas uh, in lots of ways. And it's not simple enough just to offer courses in Summerside or Charlottetown. Uh, we have to provide them in rural communities. We have to look at uh, where uh, our clientele tends to be coming from. So if I'm going to say, you know, I, I use the argument that if I had a single mom from uh, Cape Wolf as an example, and uh, she wants to take an RCW course or an LPN course. It's unrealistic to expect her to go to, uh, say, Slemon Park or Summerside to take that particular course because she's a single mom, so she needs child care supports, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've worked hard in, in growing our child care support service, and I commend the Minister of Education over there. We've been up to chances a few times in O'Leary. And I think about 80 some children <laughs> going to that site. Uh, and uh, we're still running the staff issues there too. But, uh, but re the reality is it's, a, it's a, a service that's badly needed. But yet we still have some people on the wait list, Mr. Speaker. We, can't, we have to make sure that that's part of the equation, that we have the child care support. And, uh, you know, they can't drive too far because, you know, I, you know the reality is, is that, you know, if you've been unemployed, you're a single mom, you probably don't have a real reliable vehicle. So that's a factor. You also need the, the family supports that go with uh, child care issues. So, you know, we've run into this a number of times with my, my grandchildren. Uh, you know, somebody was a close contact of a COVID or if he had the sniffles or flu and coughs kind of thing. Uh, got to get tested, they're negative, what a job trying to find a place for them to go. Somebody has to look after them, parents are working. It's just chaos in, in, in our home as a grandparent in trying to find one of the grandparents that, that will be able to fill in on the short term while, uh, you know, our, our grandson or granddaughter might have the sniffles. And I can, I'll talk even longer than that when we come into how that process works, but that's, <laughs> that's quite, a, quite a thing if you've got the sniffles and you're, and you're uh, tested negative for COVID. Where do you go? No, nobody seems to want you. So, uh, so that, ha that has happened numerous times by constituents, but it's also happened to my family. And, uh, you know, I shake my head on the common sense that goes in some of these uh, policies that get implemented, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, the current state of long-term care falls on certainly many shoulders. Uh, if you look at the current job postings, we certainly have, uh, you know, a situation where our registered nurses, RNs, 25% uh, of those jobs, as we see them advertised, are in long-term care. So it's, it's not just a case, uh, you know, where we, uh, where we see uh, that it's just you know, within the whole acute care system, it's, there's a high percentage of these, these positions are in long-term care. And, uh, you know, so I think that's, that's part of the equation that we're dealing with here, Mr. Speaker. So uh, certainly in November 2021, the Nova Scotia government announced a $1.7 million for targeted recruitment in long-term care. I'm not sure what we have for Prince Edward Island here, Mr. Speaker, but we certainly see the evidence that the, the numbers are, are rising. And, uh, you know, so within that initiative, we saw government uh, budgeted money for skills development. We have a Department of Skills here. I know that you can, you know, if, if, you, if there is an RCW course where you could go, that made sense for you as a family member. You can, you know, you can probably be able to draw on employment insurance while you're taking that uh, course. You can probably get some uh, a tuition, a certain amount of that covered, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, though, and, you know, child care stuff, that, that, but you have to have all those things. Once again, if I was looking at O'Leary, if we put a uh, course for uh, 10 people, say, to train them as an RN or a LPN or a, a RCW, which we've done before, uh, you know, the fact is, could you find childcare? I would say you might, but it would be touch and go. Uh, so that would be a factor in the equation. Uh, then the other thing that always th pops up, and I, and I think this is a real important thing to note, is that all our institutions, whether it's Margaret Conley School of Nursing or whether it's Holland College or whatever, they usually have a minimum uh, amount of class size. And I get that there has to be some sense of that, but 
if you're going to do this in the rural communities where you re that's where the workers are at, you need to come to the workers. You need to provide them uh, where, uh, where they can meet all these types of services that they require, Mr. Speaker. So first thing, the class size, oh, we didn't, we we're looking for 15 students, but we only found 10. Guess we can't do the course, so the 10 that were from up around, I'll say the Ulary area, guess you're gonna have to go to Summerside. Well, now all of a sudden they can't go. It's too far, it, they don't have the supports, the vehicle is reliable, the list goes on. That's the type of issues that this government has to deal with, Mr. Speaker. It has to get down and get dirty and make that work. So, you, so if it's a case that the training institution doesn't have meet the minimum target, and it's within reason, I'm not saying if you had one that you do it, but if, you, if it's within reason, compensate that institution to be able to provide that. That's what you've got to get doing. You know, that, that's what will give you some solutions. And then you're getting people that are in rural communities that don't have to travel too far to their workplace, don't have to travel too far to their place of training, and when they do that, you're going to have some that's going to last longer, you're going to retain them, they've got all the family supports around them, and you're going to have a better chance of success. Now, if you compensate them fairly, so that, you know, within the region that they're, uh, they're getting a reasonable pay, uh, then I think you're, you're going to have something. That's what you've got to get doing. So when you have 36 ARCW, LPN positions, another 30 or some coming because they're internal, you know, you can, you can solve some of these problems. But in, in two and a half, three years, I haven't seen nothing from these guys on this stuff. So that's where we got to get, get down. That's what the competition is doing out there, Mr. Speaker. They're putting big money up here, Mr. Speaker. And uh, they're finding the solutions and are going to find the solutions. And I go back to saying it's 36 weeks. It's not that long. So, you know, that's, that's some of the stuff that I'm starting to see, Mr. So, you know, so, Mr. Speaker, all our recruiters are tasked with hiring assistants, other health care workers. You know, have we even looked at how, what we can do from getting people from abroad? You know, but that, that starts to get a little more complicated because then you've got to have the housing to back them and things of that nature. But, you know, I, I believe we have islanders here. We provide training courses, the Minister of Fisheries and Community. They have courses, the EDA programs and career bridges and some of those things that they fund to help, you know, people get their insurable earnings. Let's, let's maybe put that towards getting people in training programs that can give them the hardcore skills that they can, they can uh, provide where, where our needs are, Mr. Speaker. You know, if we look at another jurisdiction, Ontario. I don't want to always compare us to Ontario, but you know, recently they announced an invest 73 million over three years to train and provide clinical placements for over 16,000 personal support workers and nursing students in long-term care. You know, and I, I see that they've now got their advertisement for the nursing summer student program uh, out and hopefully getting applicants. But I keep looking for the health futures. Is, was that going to go again this year? I, I'm assuming it will. I mean, it went last the year before. But where, where's the advertisements? Let's get them out there. Let's get people being aware of them. All the other summer jobs are, are advertised. Health Future is a good program because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take students, you know, to try to give them some experience in working in long-term care facilities, our, our hospital facilities, even our private sector, to, uh, to get some background and training to see if they like that. But I, I looked here on, uh, on Sunday, not, nothing on Health Futures. The ad advertisements are still for 2021. I assume it's going to go, but if it's going to go, let's get the advertisement. Don't, don't, if you're trying to compete against uh, park workers and, and the golf course workers, get your students out ready for the Health Futures workers. Get them out there. They, they want to know. They want, they want a plan too, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, you know, so if they're going to train uh, 16,000 personal support workers and nursing students in long-term care, that's a fair chunk of people. This is also a top of uh, previously announced funding uh, and ambitious efforts that were outlined in earlier 2020 as part of the Better Place to Work in Ontario in long-term care staffing. And we know Ontario has had problems, so at least they're trying to be uh, proactive and trying to get some of this thing solved, Mr. Speaker. But, you know... Uh, so, like I say, and, I, and if I even go back, I, the minister may correct me on this one, but I, but I, I do recall maybe Health Futures that skipped a year or, or might have been the nursing student. There was one year that they skipped one year, I believe, that it didn't uh, operate. You're probably... That was just before 2019, I believe. 
Oh, it was it? <laughs> anyway, I don't think it was under us, but anyway, but I believe that there was one year that there, they didn't offer it. But, but these are things that, you know, that are very important that we uh, deal with, Mr. Speaker. So, so once again, Mr. Speaker, the government still to this day won't even tell you how many doctors, how many health care workers we need to support a growing population. You know, it's all well and good to say we've got, you, you recruited so many doctors, but the demands have increased. Your government is reaping the benefits from extra property taxes that are coming in. Our property, property values have gone up. I know it's at 4% that they increase their taxes every year. Well, doctors were recruited back in 2016, I guess. Well, there's doctors always, let's say, I, I was, it was funny actually uh, when they came out with an announcement that they had 40 doctors over the next two, two years that came, Mr. Speaker. So I checked with my former deputy. So, well, I think we were, that, those, those were numbers, those were numbers that we did, yeah, that's, we did the same. So there's nothing new there. And, and I might, and, 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 and I, <laughs> that's only two times two plus one. <laughs> So, so once again, Mr. Speaker, if I, if I go comparable, let's go to the patient registry, you are given an obligation to provide a level of service. You're getting the taxation, you're getting more people requiring services, so you're getting money. So when it comes to a patient registry that at my time was 8,000, which is 5,000 plus three, you can, you, can, you can go to their numbers of 22,000. And, and he couldn't even know if that's accurate because they get doctors that, uh, uh, that keep people on a panel size just to see if they uh, uh, can find another doctor to fill the voids. I think Dr. Crothers, I don't know if you ever filled those positions, but he had 8,000 doctors, and they haven't been put in the patient registry yet, Mr. Speaker. So, so that's you know, what we look at when we see our health care system in Prince Edward Island, which I think can only be described as in disarray. Uh, you know, when you talk to people, like I talked to this RCW worker that left the position, um, you know, you, you hear a lot of things that, gee, boy, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, so I, you know, it's great for the minister to say he's, uh, you know, talks to people, but maybe he needs to listen to people too and see what their, what their problems really are and how you can come up with some solutions in that. You know, once again, we went from first to worst in Atlantic Canada, Mr. Speaker. When it comes from first to, first to worst, it's uh, you know. So you have to have plans in place. You have to have an ability to deliver these services, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I just think I'm getting a little tired of uh, COVID being the problem, Mr. Speaker. It's getting a little. <laughs> it's a little long in the tooth for my liking, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> So, uh, so you know, we have to compete with these other provinces. They have the same problems. I know our numbers are probably a bit worse than others, but still, I, I'm con quite confident we can we can function on this, and uh, we can't be losing our strategy when it comes to uh, dealing with. Uh, you know, our funding issues, our human resources issue, which are big challenges. So we need to get our contracts with our uh, community care facilities that deliver services to our long-term care. We need to get that put behind us, Mr. Speaker. We need to uh, make sure that, uh, you know, our operations that we run, that all those beds are, are fully utilized, that our facilities are staffed, they're delivering a level of service that uh, Islanders expect when, they, when their loved ones are there. And, uh, you know, if, if it, the only solution we can get to help some of these people for the enjoyment is wait for spring till the snow melts so we can see out our windows, that's a strategy that's not going to work. And it, just, it, just, it just shows a, a cavalier attitude towards what we believe. So I think recruited and retention go hand in hand, no matter uh, what the industry goes with it, Mr. Speaker. I used to be an employment counselor. I kind of have a little background in understanding, you know, what uh, it takes for, uh, you know, quality of life and what it uh, takes to retain an employee and, and, and hire the right ones, too. I think that's another factor when we get into uh, selecting people. It's, you know, knowing who fits in our system well and where they can uh, succeed at, Mr. Speaker. And uh, so when you go to a new job, you want to know that you're working with your coworkers and that everybody's in good spirits and everybody counts on everybody else and they feel supported in their roles. And whether it's management, whether it's... Uh, you know, the, the person who, uh, you know, cleans the rooms or, or the snow remover from the parking lot, Mr. Speaker, that there's an attitude and atmosphere that they enjoy going and they want to deliver that service, Mr. Speaker. Our current frontline staff are our best marketers. You know, they're the ones, if they're happy, and they and I hear that all the time, but, you know, well, that facility, I don't know if I want to go there. Uh, you know, so, yes, it's great to have some of those choices today, Mr. Speaker, but... Uh, you have to, uh, you know, 
places, there are places that are known for really good work atmospheres, maybe others that are a little wanting, and uh, we have to try to make as many of them as good as we possibly can, Mr. Speaker. And that's where I think it's important. Talk to our staff, all of them. I know I, you know, I'm sure the minister's been around to a lot of the facilities. I've been to, I've been to them all here in Prince Edward Island and had the chance to talk to them. I remember even going into the boiler room at some of our hospitals and chatting with the, the people in the boiler room. And, uh, Right you know, there. trying to you know Good get minister. get a sense of what what they may require. I just you know, I just wish that our time was finances were a little tighter than what they seem to be these days. So that sort of prevented me from getting as much accomplished as I would have liked to have done. But, but yeah, you know, so the and, and I get it. You know, you know, I, I remember in my time that you know we'd be trying to get a budget. Premier would some come and say we got uh, got a four percent increase and thought I was happy. I said four percent. <laughs> we're growing at about seven. That's what we're growing at. That's probably more than that now, is it, Minister? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, no, but you know, as far as how our health care budget, it's a big budget and it's a big challenge in trying to keep it uh, in, within a certain amount, but uh, you know, and you're, you're totally right. As the member from Morel Donald says, it is about priorities. And uh, you know, uh, this government's priorities are about paving roads. Great, great road, great to do. Yeah. I, in my riding, I got this dandy road, 1.7. 1.7 kilometers, the best looking road you've ever seen, Mr. Speaker, yeah. to, to one cottage oh. of the Premier's buddies. I mean, beautiful. <laughs> no, I, I'm not unhappy about it. Great. No, I know. I wouldn't pave it. I wouldn't have paved it now, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. <laughs> for a guy's cottage for 1.7 kilometers. But, but you know, uh, that's the type of stuff that happens, Mr. Speaker. That's a priority that this government has chosen. I would probably rather put our priorities into having our staff and our training, oh, and, and good, good training cases for our people in our long-term care facilities, and uh, that we can train people and that we can retain them and keep them happy, Mr. Speaker. That's what's important, Mr. Speaker. So, so anyway, Mr. Speaker, as we kind of bring this thing to a little bit more of a conclusion as a mover of this motion, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> uh, I just think it's very important that we, that we do focus on those things, Mr. Speaker. I want to see I want to see our numbers be as good or, or better than Nova Scotia or Brunswick when it comes to per capita comparables. Uh, you know, I want to see that our all our beds, all 1,268 beds are operational in this province, Mr. Speaker, that they're staffed accordingly, and that the patient level of care is that the four hours, whatever it's supposed to be, if it's four hours, that's what I want to see. I don't want no, you know, cutting back to reduce those patient hours. That's, that's something that it's remained unanswered. We've not got clarity in this, uh, in this uh, house on that answer, Mr. Speaker, that there's as minimal of unsafe protocols at both our, our, our private facilities as well as our or government facilities, Mr. Speaker, and uh, you know that these are the types of things that I want to see. And I want to see our staff, uh, you know, happy, and uh, I don't want to hear of them quitting because of uh, you know overworked, cause stress, stressful work hours and excessive hours and shifts, Mr. Speaker. I don't want to see that. So, so with that, that's why I am moving this particular motion called. Target recruitment and retention strategy for long-term care in the province of PEI, Mr. Speaker, and look forward to our seconder and others weighing in on this discussion. <laughs> the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party house leader, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to uh, Follow that incredible piece of work. <laughs> I can try. A lot of great, a lot of great points in that speech. Oh yeah. Motion's good. Again, again, we're yeah, we're talking about uh, long-term care and the importance of long-term care. And um, you know, when I look at this motion, it's important, and I think I think the minister knows, and everybody's aware of it, but where our society is going in the next 10 years, we could be looking at numbers well above 1,200, well above our capacity, more like 2,000 people that would need long-term care. This problem is growing. So we're in a little bit of a, a crisis now, but where we're going, we need to start now. We need to have a solid plan, both recruitment and retention. We talk about we talk about long-term care workers and we talk about you know, uh, virtual sittings and working from home. They don't have the luxury to do that. They never did. They had to go, they had to show up to work. 
and and it's a good thing they did because they care about some of the some of the most important islanders in our society are are, are trying to enjoy the best quality of life they have in our long-term care facilities and it's the workers that sacrifice and we talked about we we joked around about you know the minister getting uh getting some relief from the snowstorms and and potentially uh wiping or the windows coming uh free of snow um i'm hearing from long-term care workers that stayed at work for two three days at a time without leaving to man the ship to say hey you know what we're going to come in and stop this right now you need me i'm here i'm here for you and and minister that bought us a little bit of time um, and the hard-working islanders and the, the the nurses we talked about nurses today that have come out of retirement um, to help us out both in long-term care both in our hospitals they have done that unselfishly they don't know they're, they're they're retired they're enjoying their life and and they come into a situation where they where they're working in COVID environments and they can't go home to see their families they have to isolate that's to me that's that's real true heroes um, in that and, and they have to be acknowledged minister um, I had a conversation with the premier about this too and he asked me what 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 needs to be done here in in this type of situation and I said you have to value them if you want my opinion you have to value them and recruitment is one thing we talked about that with a previous motion but valuing our nurses valuing our RCW they need to be recognized they need to see the minister in the ball the room or wherever he wants to be um, to say hey you know what y you stood up and and you saved us in an important time in our history because both the both clients in in long-term care facilities and the staff that work them everybody is just trying to live well and they don't have any control right now and you go in and you speak to employees that's all people want is to control their environment know what they're doing and feel recognized so I, I i hope you take that that piece of advice and say that everybody who works in long-term care not necessarily they don't necessarily want um a bonus here and there they want a pin that said i work through COVID. i was on the front lines of COVID, and i did whatever i could and i would do it again and I, I think that that's a little bit of the retention strategy that we have to work on. Little, 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 maybe whatever, like a plaque or something, Minister. I see the Minister of Fisheries giving me a few ideas there. Yeah. Well, maybe he could work on it. Like get them, get them something. Do something about the 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 value of 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 what we see and what we do for them. But then, but then we see in, in, in a recent standing committee that we're, we're struggling to meet the minimum standards and where that leaves us right now and what does that care look like for the, the, the people that are, we're trying to care for. And it's, 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 it's not a good situation. We have to figure out ways to get out of that. And you know, you look at it as, and I use the quote again, I've used this with this government before, in this first two days you've seen it, preparation destroys excuses. Well, in my mind, you didn't prepare, and that's all we're getting over here is excuses. And that's not good enough for, for right now. And we have to look at the plans that we've created. The Premier said yesterday, we couldn't have seen this wave coming. We couldn't have seen this coming. And we could. The whole world saw it coming. And it hit PEI. And we weren't ready. So it could happen again. And we got to make sure we're ready for it next time. And how do we do that? Is that we have to have the standards in place and we have to make sure that we get, get our numbers in order so that we don't see this happening because the people in long-term care deserve that. And I know the minister's working hard. I know, I know you're trying to do this, but we, we need more resilience. We need more at activity. Somebody in my district came to me and said, hey, you know what, they talked about that. And I think it was Sh Charlottetown Victoria Park that brought it up in the standing committee. And the, a, a family member said, hey, you know what, I'm going to go over there and clean off the windows with my seven-year-old. And she went through the process. She went through the process, and she went and got the, and you know, she got denied because of liability. She got denied. She sent me a note. And, and I'm like, well, 
if we're if we're working on unsafe protocols and and provisional licenses and everything else, why are they not allowed to go clean windows up? And that happened, Minister. So it's just things like that that we, we need to understand that we're going to we're going to um, we're going to am I going to adjourn debate right now, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. I'll, conti I'll continue. I'll continue. Oh, you want me to keep going? Minister of Action. Honourable go. Member. Good, good motion. Adjourn. Good adjourn with a seconder, please. Uh, uh, the leader of the. Shall we carry? Next week, we got a You'll have more time. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the member from Moraldona that the fifth order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Carry. Time for a break. Order number five, an act to amend the Business Corporations Act number two, bill number 58, read a second time. Shall I carry? No. Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. <laughs> Let's try that Sorry, again. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> order number five is ordered for second reading. Yeah. Minister? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the member from Moraldona that the said bill be read a second time. Shut up, Carrie. Bill number 58, an act to amend the Business Corporations Act number two, read a second time. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the member from Merrill Dona that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration said bill. Shut up, Carrie. The Honorable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. whole house to take into consideration the bill to be intitled an act to amend the business corporations act number two a request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor shall it be granted Good afternoon and welcome. Would you please state your name and position for Hansard? Uh, Curtis Jones, uh, solicitor in the Financial Consumer Services Division, Department of Justice and Public Safety. Thank you very much. Honourable uh, members, uh, it is the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause. There are, we'll just open it up to general. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm now going to take a list and compile names. Okay. Uh, Summerside Wilmot. Sure. Uh, yes. So no problem. The uh, the department uh, received a request from uh, the, the the First Nations uh, group in, in PEI, and uh, the request was to make the amendment uh, to to include the words unincorporated association 
in the definition of person. Uh, currently, the Act has the word association, uh, but it doesn't specify what that means, essentially, uh, whether it means only incorporated associations like a co-op or unincorporated uh, associations. Uh, and, and our uh, interpretation has been and, and is essentially to uh, view it as including both, uh, and, and we've kind of applied it that way. Um, but uh, the, the uh, request was uh, to essentially state that in the Act um, such that it would clarify uh, a potential for um, interpreting it as not including uh, the word unincorporated. Um, and uh, our understanding uh, from, from our discussions was that uh, this had been raised by, by their legal counsel as, as a potential ambiguity uh, in the event they're, they're registering companies under the BCA. So um, the request was to uh, consider advancing a, an amendment to specify that the word unincorporated is included in, in that particular term. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. My understanding when we had gone through this bill is that it actually didn't change the content in any way. In fact, it was, as you've said, just clarifying what the bill always intended for things to be. So That's I correct. assume that your list of people that you would have needed to consult with this would be nominal at best because it really doesn't have any intended changes. But were there groups that you needed to consult with on this legislation? Uh, no, you're correct. Uh, we we, we uh, dealt with the uh, the organization bring forward the request, um, uh, but I also uh, and, and uh, kind of our, our folks in the department uh, conferred with our counterparts across Canada just to make sure we weren't you know, missing something in terms of that. Um, and as as uh, you noted, um, it, it isn't from our perspective changing anything, um, but it is specifying what our understanding and interpretation has been of that particular term. Summer side Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. So I can definitely appreciate the desire to be more clear, and I can also appreciate why First Nations communities would like to know exactly how they are uh, captured or not captured under this. But for the purpose of the Act, what is an unincorporated association? Sure. Like what would that encompass? Sure. So, uh, I mean, an incorporated association, as I think I might have mentioned briefly there, it would be a, a cooperative association would be yep. an example of that. So an unincorporated association would be essentially another, any other type of entity that would be uh, two or more individuals kind of working together kind of towards a, a common uh, objective. Uh, a joint venture, for example, would be, would be considered an unincorporated uh, uh, association. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I don't have any further questions on this. I, I can absolutely appreciate where you're coming from. It seems pretty clear to me. The last thing I would just ask is you had said you have consulted with your counterparts mm -hmm. across the country, and is this a similar interpretation? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and uh, just the, the province of Ontario in particular has this specified in their legislation, and we actually have it in other legislation as well, just that our division deals with. Notably, the Securities Act and the Securities Transfer Act both specify unincorporated association in their definition of person, so this actually aligns with those definitions. Just Perfect. I'm good with that. Thank you, Chair. Any further questions? Shall I carry? Chair Just me. Do I get it? An act to amend the Business Corporations Act number two. Shall it carry? Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair. The chair report the bill Shall it carry? Is the next bill, like the bill that we started yesterday, mm -hmm. is that on today? I believe so, but it's further down the list. Okay. I'm not sure. Do you know which one it was? Uh, it was the provincial court. Yes, it was. Okay.
Two, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed the same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Sean Carey. Carey. Okay. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of uh, Environment, Water and Climate Change that the eighth order of today be now read. What are you in Order number eight, Miscellaneous Statute Amendment Act 2022, Bill number 52, ordered for second reading. Show the carry. Here. Uh, Donald, Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Energy, Water, and Climate Action that the bill be read a second time. Getting closer. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Environment, Energy, and Climate. Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act 2022, Bill Number 52, read a second time. Donovan Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm the second by the member from Royal Dona. That's easier. Resolve itself into a committee of the whole house to take into consideration the said bill. Sean Carey. Carey. The, the honourable member from Monaco Kilmuir, do chair the committee of the whole house, please. Statues. Okay, let's go. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be entitled Miscellaneous Statute Amendment Act 2022. Is it the pleasure? I guess we'll. Um, you have a minister. Do you have a stranger you'd like to bring on the floor? Uh, granted. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, come on in. <laughs> there, there is. 
They're beating me to it. <laughs> And Minister, you said you don't have an opening statement for this bill, so is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause or open it up to general questions? General questions. General questions? Okay. You have to introduce. Oh, yes. Could you introduce yourself, your sure. name and uh, position for Hansard? Blair Barber, Legislative Specialist, Justice and Public Safety. Thank you. All right. We'll open it up to questions. Uh, Summerside Wilmot. I was just hoping, uh, oh, let me start again. Welcome, Blair. Thanks for being here today. I was wondering if you could just give us an overview of some of the main changes that this bill sure. uh, accomplishes. Uh, this bill replaces references to Her Majesty, where they appear in our various statutes, with gender-neutral language. So that's um, aligned with, uh, you, you will have noticed a lot of our, our amendments were trying to make language gender-neutral. Uh, also in anticipation of the eventual succession of the throne, so it's work that needs to be done. Uh, this bill also corrects anomalies, inconsistencies, outdated terminology, and minor errors in statutes that have been identified by the Legislative Council Office. Uh, Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. It's been my understanding that this doesn't actually change anything in practice in this bill. This is just um, the routine work of your department going through it and updating all of the many, many pieces of legislation that fall under your jurisdiction. Would that be a fair assessment, Blair? That's correct. In order to do something in a miscellaneous statute amendment act, it can't be controversial, it can't involve the spending of public funds, it cannot prejudicially affect the rights of persons, and it can't create new offenses or subject a new class of persons to an existing offense. Anything you wanted to add to that, Minister? <laughs> I'm good. Thank You're you, good. Chair. Uh, any further questions? Shall the bill carry? Carry. carry. I move the title. <laughs> Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act 2022. Shall it carry? Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted, be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and let the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intitual Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act 2022, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action that the 13th word of the day be now read. <laughs> Shall it carry? Order number 13, an act to amend the Provincial Court Act, Bill number 59, ordered for in committee. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action that this House to now resolve itself into committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Yeah. The Honourable Member from Monocle Kilmuir to chair the committee of the whole House, please.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Provincial Court Act. Um, we were already in, I guess the Minister, do you have a stranger you'd like to bring on the floor? Yes, sir. Uh, a request has been made to bring a stranger on the floor. Shall it be granted? Welcome. If you could just state your name and title for Hanser, please. Uh, Cl Claire Henderson, Director of Family Law and Court Services with the Department of Justice and Public Safety. Thank you, Claire. And this bill we were uh, just started debating. Do we have any questions? Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Welcome back, Claire. The last time you were here, I had been asking some questions on whether or not this um, these amendments will implement all of the Judicial Remuneration Review Commission um, recommendations, or will it leave any outstanding? Um, there are uh, still discussions ongoing surrounding uh, some implementation uh, changes to the text of the pension plan. Um, that discussion is still happening, but this will ensure the implementation of the, the, the rest of the recommendations of the Commission. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I was just wondering if you could explain who appoints judges under this legislation. Part-time judges, excuse me. Um, so the amendment will create a right of election as a part-time judge for judges who have retired. And so um, the appointment, so technically the appointment of the part-time judge will be based on who is appointed a full-time provincial court judge and it will be a decision for a judge who is eligible under the new amendment to elect part-time. And so there, there are requirements in the legislation for a certain number of years of service on the bench or that they um, have retired. And so it is ultimately the decision of a judge who is eligible whether or not they wish to be available as a part-time judge. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that clarification. And if a person chooses to be available, they are appointed by? Um, it, it wouldn't actually be an appointment. It's an election. Oh. And so they get to elect to sit as a part-time judge, and they would notify the chief of the provincial court that they wish to be available. And then the legislation um, allows the, the proposed amendment allows the chief judge of the provincial court to uh, determine whether or not the a, a part-time judge is going to preside over a matter. Summerside, Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I had misunderstood that earlier. I appreciate that clarification. So, essentially, any retired judge who wished to could now be a part-time judge, so it could increase the pool of judges by as many eligible people as are interested in doing so? Um, so it doesn't change the number of um, appointed full-time provincial no, court judges in the judges province, but it would create effectively a roster of available part-time judges. So this is a change from the current language in the new Provincial Court Act, which maintains the, the language from the current Provincial Court Act. Um, so under the current regime, if the, if the Provincial Court wished to have a part-time judge hear a matter, it is actually the LGIC that appoints part-time judges. Yes. And so the proposed amendment is actually a more constitutionally robust process yep. because judges who are independently appointed through the appointment process get to determine whether or not they wish to continue to sit rather than having it be a standalone government appointment. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. That makes loads of sense to me. Out of curiosity, what is the reason for the retirement age that is tied to full-time judges currently? Um, the, reti the mandatory retirement age of provincially appointed judges is actually based on recommendations of the Judicial Renumeration Review Commission. And so the mandatory retirement age in our legislation is based on the independent recommendations of the Commission. Retirement age and eligibility for a pension is a benefit of, a, a, and a financial benefit of appointment as a provincially appointed judge. And so based on constitutional requirements for independence, the, pen, the mandatory retirement age is based on a recommendation of the Independent Judicial Renumeration Review Commission. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. And in some respects, this would go against that, would it? Because generally, a retired judge uh, 
would retire, excuse me, a judge would retire at the age of 70. But in this case, a judge who would be required to retire could stay on as a part-time judge. Right. So the bill does allow for a part-time judge to sit till the age of 75. That is in line with the recommendations of the Review Commission and beyond the mandatory retirement age of 70 years of a full-time judge. And so the, the bill recommends making that change on the basis of the independent recommendations from the commission. Mm -hmm. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. I'm just curious if that's consistent with how other provinces handle their part-time judges. Um, there's a variety of mechanisms across the country for the appointment of part-time judges for provincial courts across the country. Uh, the, majority, the majority of them have comparable um, processes whereby judges can elect to sit part-time. There's some differences based on the differences of size in this jurisdiction and the complement of full-time judges. For sure. But the process. Sorry. Sorry. No. Members, it's just getting difficult to... To hear. Pretend you're interested, folks. Thank you. <laughs> Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Apologies. Could you say that again, Claire? I missed that. So there's comparable processes that differ in some ways across the country. The, the majority of jurisdictions allow for the appointment of part-time judges provincially and territorially, and they also allow the, a, a judge to make an election to their respective chiefs to do so. Um, again, because of the differences in size in this jurisdiction. So, for example, in PEI, we have currently three provincial court judges. BC would have hundreds, yeah. and so they have different considerations and different uh, approaches. But the um, approach that's being adopted is based on, again, the recommendations of the Review Commission in yeah. consultation with our provincial court. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. And just one other question, Blair. Uh, Claire, I apologize. For oh, that. It's confusing. We're, <laughs> we're very similar. <laughs> <laughs> and haircut. <laughs> Thank you for that so very much. That's so funny. Um, curious if this is just a, a broad question, but is the pool of part time judges in exclusively retired judges? Is there any other pathway that you could have a part-time judge? I'm just curious on that. So if you were to refer to the, the bill, and I apologize, I flipped too far in my book. I apologize. They haven't distributed the bill yet, Claire. So. OK. Um, so uh, the, the bill actually adds a section to the Provincial oh, Court you, Act that says a judge may elect to serve as a part-time judge if they've attained the age of 70 and have retired, yeah. or they've served at least 15 years as a judge and has retired before reaching the age of 70. And so, so currently, retired. the part-time complement comes exclusively from provincial court judges appointed in this jurisdiction who have retired and have not yet reached the age of 75. I was curious about that because uh, in a jurisdiction that is as small as ours, where there are so few judges, as you point out, you want as much depth on the bench as possible, the diverse background of experiences. And I was originally wondering if this would be a pathway to appoint judges with different backgrounds, but it sounds like not necessarily. They would have to probably be willing to give up service in any other capacity. The, remember, th this provision law. doesn't change how full-time judges are appointed, I mean and, and that process is a constitutional process that's born, that in PEI has, has borne the scrutiny of the Supreme Court of Canada, and judicial complement, um, including the number of judges that we have, um, is based on the needs of the jurisdiction and the um, recommendations of the review, the Renumeration Review Commission don't actually relate to judicial complement. And so this be... bill responds exclusively to issues that relate to the financial compensation and potential benefit of part-time judges. Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I want to be clear, Blair. Uh, Claire, oh my gosh, I can't get your name right today. I apologize, Claire. I want to be clear. I'm in no way referring to the complement of full-time judges. I'm in exclusively talking about part-time judges when I say it seems like an opportunity for diversity, but it seems like the way the bill is drafted, that's not a possibility anyway. Right. So I appreciate your clarity on that. I'm good. You're good. Uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so will, will 
Will this affect um, court hours, or are we? Or is there going to be more court hours available if if uh, any of these changes? So the the um, the scheduling of court and the hours that the court are available uh, falls under something called judicial administration, and that the the hours that the court sits and is available is at the discretion of the court itself, and so. Um, again, this bill relates exclusively to matters that relate to the implementation of the review commission. So theoretically, as a result of these changes, there will be uh, additional part-time judges that may be available to deal with things like, for example, if there's a conflict, a case that comes up that would be a conflict for the current judges that are sitting on the provincial court. Or, for example, if, heaven forbid, all three of the judges were to be to fall ill, for example, with COVID, the, the court would be able to elect to have a part-time judge attend to deal with matters. And so this, this bill doesn't deal with issues such as when the court sits or court hours. And, and how Charles many... And West Royalty. Thank you, Chair. And um, is, there's obviously more of a need for part-time judges if it came out of uh, the recommendations. How many judges will we, will this, how many can we assume can be part-time after this? Like, what's our pool, I guess? Well, again, it is the decision of the retired judge or the, a judge who is eligible under the legislation whether or not they wish to elect to sit part-time. The members may recall in the previous session, um, this bill actually amends the new Provincial Court Act, uh, not the existing act. And so the, the new Provincial Court Act also allows more circumstances for the appointment of judges from outside the province if it's necessary. And so it's a little bit of a difficult question to say both what the pool is, because we can't speak for the judges. I will note that there was a recent retirement from the provincial court, and that retired judge would be eligible as a result of this amendment to elect to sit part-time. That being said, that's a judicial decision within their own discretion. And so it's a difficult question to answer, but this does permit the opportunity for that to happen and create a more constitutionally robust process that a part-time judge can be available. Yeah. Cheryl Town West Royalty. And the, the, the one-third of the, the, the salary, for I know the judges, they, they work all kinds of hours. You know, like for, but they're, now they're restricted to one-third. What, what, could you just talk a little bit more about that? So that piece of the legislation actually deals with the total compensation for all of the judges who may elect for part-time during the year. And so, again, it's a little bit of a distinction between the issue of judicial complement and the work of the Remuneration Commission in recommending what the financial compensation for judges in the province should be. And so this doesn't limit, this doesn't change anything to do with the compensation of full-time provincial court judges. What the bill says is that if the, the chief of the provincial court assigns matters to part-time judges, the total amount of salary that is paid to each of those part-time judges within a fiscal year can't exceed one-third of the salary of a full-time provincial court judge. Charlottetown West Royalty. I feel so much better about that. That's, uh, I, I know it's complicated and it's, it's interesting. Um, no, I... Uh, I, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out how the, this legislation will help people actually using the court system. So, you know, like, will it be? I know COVID was difficult with with the judges, and I guess that's what I'm trying to get to is how how does this benefit people using this system? This benefits the administration of justice in two ways. One, by creating a more constitutionally appropriate process for the appointment of part-time judges but two, also ensuring that in the event that there are circumstances where an additional judge is needed, there would be the opportunity to have those judges available. So for example, if recently retired former Chief Judge Douglas was to elect to sit part-time and there was a conflict among the other three provincial court judges, prior to this amendment, 
the chief would have had to make it a, make a request to have a part-time judge appointed, which has to go through a process that takes some time, which may result in delays in the administration of justice. And so the people in the province very much will benefit from having an existing potential roster of part-time judges that the chief can call from, call, call judges to attend from in a timely way. Charlottetown West Royalty. That's great. Uh, thank you, Claire. Appreciate it. Any further questions? Shall the bill carry? Yes, carry. An act to occur. Oh, no, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole house, having had under consideration a bill to be intitual an act to amend the Provincial Court Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Social Development and Housing that the 14th order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Carry, carry. Order number 14, an act to amend the Building Codes Act, Bill number 46, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Minister of Finance, <coughs> Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of uh, Social Development and Housing that the bill be read a second time. Shall I carry? Carry. An act to amend the Building Codes Act, Bill number 46, read a second time. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm the by the Minister of Social Development and Housing that this House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall I carry? Carry. The Honourable Member from Montecule Kilmuir, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Buildings Code Act. Uh, Minister, do you, do you wish to bring a stranger on the floor? Yes. Uh, permission has been asked to bring a stranger on the floor. Shall it be granted? <laughs> state your name and title for answer, please. Yes, Andrea Triolo, Senior Legislative and Applied Research Analyst, Agriculture and Land. Thank you, Andrea. Is it the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause? Or? Um, so uh, a lot of these uh, amendments are more housekeeping in nature. We're correcting section references. Uh, we're making sure that organizations are properly named in the act. Um, there is a section where we are repealing um, section nine as it was never proclaimed. So we're getting rid of that in the Building Codes Act. Uh, leader of the Opposition. Great. Um, 
Let's start with this section. We're going. We're going. This is the whole bill we're talking about here, Chair. Is that yes, right? Yes. Okay. Is that what you're, Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thanks. So we'll start with section nine, the, the part that's being repealed, which uh, I believe is about building inspectors. And can you just explain, for the record, why that was never proclaimed and why we're now repealing it? Yes. So when it was initially drafted, um, there was thinking that building officials and building inspectors, who are both under the Act. Um, would perform different functions. What those functions were was not identified at the time that it was drafted. It was left to regulations. So once the regulations were drafted, it became clear that building officials will be doing the work under the Building Codes Act, and there isn't a need for these building inspectors. Um, so that section was never proclaimed, and since we're making some housekeeping amendments, we are going to repeal that section as well. Leader of the Opposition. Um, so it sounds like semantics here, Andrea, but I, I'm wondering why there were two separate designations in the bill and, and now one. Is there a reason why we didn't go ahead and hire inspectors? Or I, I don't know why it, we never hired inspectors to begin with. I think there was an idea perhaps that a building official would do one part of the job and a building inspector might do another part of that job. And then when the regulations were drafted, it became clear that everything would be under a building official. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. So just, just for clarity, the work that was intended to be done by building inspectors is now being done by officials. So they're doing what they were originally intended to do, plus the tasks that were originally put under the the inspectors, is that correct? Yeah, at the time there wasn't really a, a contemplation in terms of who, what building officials would do and what inspectors would do separately. So when we put it together, when we put the regulations together, it became clear that it would actually just be one position. Got it. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can you tell us how many building officials we have here on Prince Edward Island currently? So I know that there are four building official positions. Uh -huh. Uh, I believe two right now are being advertised. So that would be two currently working and two advertised. Great. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. So we have uh, two building officials to cover the entire province. My understanding is that's what yeah. right now, yes. Okay. Leader How, of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. And what, what is the role of those building officials? What do they, what do they actually do? So their role is are listed under the regulations. So let me just find the right section here. I thought I had the section here, and now I think I've lost my place. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So, um, a building official uh, will carry out inspections. This is under section 25 of the regulations yeah. um, for at different stages of construction, and the regulations outline which what stages those are. Right. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. So, um, the officials are carrying out inspections at various points during construction of. Is it just new builds, Andrea, or is it renovations above a certain amount as well? I don't know if it's renovations. I'd, I'd have to go back and check. Okay. Leader of the opposition. Just a frivolous question, maybe, but if the officials are doing inspections, why did we call them officials rather than inspectors? <laughs> It's a, it's a good question. Uh, I don't have the answer other than that's the, the section that was proclaimed. Yeah. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. Um, approximately how many new builds are there on PEI? And I realize that varies from year to year, and at the moment we're in a boom when it comes to new construction. But on average, how many would we expect to see on PEI in a year? I'd, I'd have to go back to the department <coughs> and get that information. Minister, you wouldn't have any sense of how many there are? I, I don't off the top of my head, no. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. And I, I don't know either, but I know it's a lot. Uh, over the last couple of years, there's been a tremendous amount of construction on Prince Edward Island. And 
how many times do these officials have to inspect um, a new a new construction during during the course of the build from start to finish? Uh, there are three stages listed under the regulations, uh, and that's a, a minimum standard as far as uh, I believe. So there's at least three different stages of, new, of construction. Leader of the opposition. Right, so just so I'm clear on that, it's mandatory at, at least three points during the construction of every new build on Prince Edward Island that it be inspected by an official. I yes, under the regulations, that's what it says. Okay. Leader of the opposition. But that just seems like an extraordinary amount of work for two officials to be carrying out at the moment. I don't know what the extent of those inspections would, would be, but uh, uh, given that I'm in the midst of actually building a new house myself, um, I'm aware of just how much work is involved and how many things, even a small, relatively small house like the one we're, we're building. Um, would this include also electrical and plumbing inspections, or are they separate? Those Sorry. are those are separate. So this is just for construction of okay. the building. Okay. Leader of the opposition. Great. Thanks, Chair. And I note in one of the other sections that we're actually repealing the reference to the Plumbing Act. Yes. Is that because it's covered somewhere else, or is it? Why, why are we repealing that? Yes. Yeah, so it's actually covered under Plumbing Code regulations under the Environmental Protection Act. So it shouldn't be in the Building Codes Act. Leader of the Opposition. Um, I don't see any reference to electrical inspections here. Is that also covered in a, another act? It's period? covered in another act. I'm, I, I don't know off the top of my head what the name of it okay. is. Yeah. All right. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. Um, section 7, which amends, uh, it, it's about uh, if somebody is not present, you can post, I don't know, am I looking at the right one? I think I am. Yes, serving an order under the Act on a person. Um, if you don't have the address, the order is um, sufficiently, it's sufficient if it's served, if it, sorry, sufficiently served if it's posted in a conspicuous place on the property. What sorts of orders would be served in this manner? Um, for example, so there are people will be building things without permits. And so they would put an order to cease and desist, for example, the building if they can't figure out who actually owns that particular building or that construction. Okay. Leader of the opposition. And even in the absence of that individual, um, it's deemed to have been posted as long as it's uh, done in a conspicuous place during, on the work site, is that correct? On the work site, okay. yeah. I just bring this up because there's a bill coming forward from my honourable colleague over there about um, confusion which arose when certain tax bills did not get delivered to, to individuals and, and uh, so I, I'm just wondering how often this sort of thing happens when you have to post an order and, and not knowing whether the individual is actually getting that or not. I mean work sites are a lot of people coming and going and they can easily get covered up or lost or the dog eats it or whatever. Um, it, it was land. <laughs> it, it is certainly an issue that's happened before, where uh, inspection services has tried to give an order and can't figure out where the who owns the property. So there was we did want to put a mechanism in there. How often it happens, I, I can't say right now. I will say that there's a very similar pr uh, provision in the Unsightly Property Act right. that allows the posting on a conspicuous place. Right. Leader of the opposition, and I brought it. I brought it up partly because of that, Andrew. Because I deal, you know, if you're a rural MLA, actually any MLA, I would imagine, has, has dealt with unsightly property situations in their districts before. And one of the big problems is in ensuring that the owner of a property who is, who can be absent, um, receives that notice and actually uh, acts on it. So I, I understand that um, you won't always be able to reach the person. I'm just. Uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose this is pretty typical for a situation like this, as you've just said, the Unsightly Properties Act also has it, so it's pretty standard across other legislation, is it, to have this provision? It is, and it also makes it clear is you have to, the address has to be unknown, so there, there are other sections that will serve a person if you know the address, okay. so an effort will be made to figure out who owns that property before they just post an order. 
Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. Um, currently, as you mentioned, Andrew, we have there are four positions for building officials, but only two are uh, filled. Yes. How, how long have we had two open positions for officials? That I don't know. I'd have to go back to the department and ask. Okay. I'd, I really appreciate that information because my next question was going to be, uh, is there an expectation of how long it will take before we have a full complement of building officials? I can go back with that question as well. Leader of the Opposition. And perhaps a question to the Minister. If we have two building officials who are managing at this time when we have more building than has ever happened on Prince Edward Island and they're coping with the, they have the capacity to do it, do you think we need those other two positions? Absolutely, that's why they're, they're we're trying to fill them right away. Leader of the opposition. So are the two who are currently working doing tons of overtime in order to accomplish what's required? Uh, uh, we're not getting uh, reports that they're, they're, they're able to handle it right now, but uh, yeah, definitely it's uh, causing a lot of extra work. Right. Leader of the opposition. And are there other uh, employees within the department who are capable of doing the work of building officials, or is it a very specific designation that requires training and certification to do that? There are levels of qualifications under the regulations, so you, you have to meet certain qualifications to be a building official. Okay. Leader of the opposition. I'm good. Thank Great. you, Chair. I appreciate your answers, Andrea. Thank you. Valeri and Burness. Uh, <coughs> thanks. Uh, Minister, I, I guess I've talked to you before about this. Uh, Will, will this speed anything up in the parents who have an issue with building permits? And I know this is a little separate, but uh, you know, knowing that you only have two, maybe going to four, um, you know, building permits are taking a lot, an awful long time to get approved, especially in my riding. I guess if if we can wait for these questions for, for when the budget comes, we have I think nine new positions uh, for our land division, so. Um, I hope to have uh, a great discussion over that and to get those approved. O'Leary and Burness. Well, that's appreciative. Uh, will uh, any of these building officials, like when you have all four, like will any of them be based out of O'Leary where you have your uh, septic tank spots as well as your building permits? I believe that one of the openings is Summerside and Charlottetown are the two openings. That, there, O'Leary that, and Burness. There, therein lies part of my problem. If you're, you're taking a whole section of Prince Edward Island that's that's a pretty significant size. There's a fair number of building permits. Wouldn't it make some sense to try to have everything under one roof where those people could communicate and time and easily uh, coordinate their uh, building permits, inspections, and septic tanks and plumbing, all those kinds of things? I'll take that up. With, <laughs> I'll take. I'll note that and take it up with the manager. Yeah. Valeria and Burness. So when, when a municipality makes a, a approval on a building permit, it, it then is transferred over to the uh, province for a final approval, and then uh, who does the inspection? Is that the municipality or is that the, uh, uh, the these building officials will do that? Municipalities have their own inspectors. Valeria and Burness? All municipalities? I, I'm assuming Charlottetown and Summerside. We'll say a community like O'Leary or Central Prince or some of those municipalities. So they have official plans, but right. and they do the approval of the building permit because there would be certain variances that would occur in development in a in a little rural community like that. But I guess I'm just wondering, will they play any responsibility on the inspections uh, by the officials? So what what exactly is your question? Are we putting a, <laughs> okay, so so <laughs> municipalities, uh, and I'm going to use small. Let's just say I don't want to get into Charlottetown Summerside, but they uh, they approve a building permit, they pass it on to the province for a final basically approval, then uh, uh, who does the inspection when it comes to the construction, like the, the building inspection? We do. We it's do. going to be the province. Okay, that's what I just wanted to, but that's where I can't, oh, sorry, Chair. O'Leary and Burness. So, so there, therein lies where, you know, the, you're going to have a fair bit of work to do here, and, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm hearing a lot of uh, backlog within getting building permits up in my area. I mean, I think I made a comment about five months, and, uh, uh, you know, so I, I would really hope that we're, 
really trying to streamline everything to make it go as smoothly as possible for developers. And uh, I, I know when talking to the town of O'Leary in a building permit uh, application, you know, their problem is is that they they're uh, that it's gone to tender, they're ready to start construction, but they don't have their building permit approved. Municipality approved it, so uh, so we need to have that coordination, which is why I would suggest it makes some sense to have your building official at least one of those four based out of uh, O'Leary, where you have the remaining other staff within your department. So I'll just leave that as a recommendation that I hope you'll take a look at and go from there. Charlottetown Brighton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Maybe you can clarify on this for me. I'm not quite sure. How does municipal inspectors relate to the provincial inspectors you're talking about? Under the Building Codes Act, yeah. uh, municipalities are able to appoint their own building officials, provided that they meet the qualifications under the regulations. Charlottetown Brighton. Okay, so when we speak about the province as a whole, uh, you have two sets of inspectors. You have municipal inspectors, which we are talking about here, and I mean provincial inspectors that we are talking about here, and then uh, municipal inspectors. There would be, yeah, two different, all building officials, one provincial, one appointed by the municipality. Charlottetown Brighton. So uh, would you say by far the most ins appro building approvals are done by municipal inspectors, not, not by the province? I'd have to go back and get that information. Okay. Charlottetown Brighton. Um, so does the province also exercise a a supervisory authority over the municipal inspectors? No, they would be, they're, they're considered building officials under the Act because they have the qualifications, so they would be the building officials who are overseeing that construction. Okay. Sure. Thank Charlotte you. Town, Bryce. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Take Nish Palmer Road. I'm just going to ask, you know, uh, what, uh, Colleagues at Van O'Leary and Vernas regarding, I don't usually support anything going into O'Leary. It's usually I'm trying to pull it to Tignesh. But it's property development officers and, and the backlog of building permits that we presently see um, up west. There was 1.5 positions there. And the former um, full-time head took a position, I think, within the division in, in, in something else. It, was in, it, went, it moved to a different department. Okay. Um, so that left, so when that went up again, it was posted for Summerside. So that position is now in Summerside, and West Prince now only has 0.5, I'm, I'm assuming it's 0.5, I think it's a six month uh, position. And I guess I'm going to advocate too to have another position, full time position, put into O'Leary, or at least take that six month position and put um, the individual who's in there now uh, full time. Is that anything that you yep, no, potentially? I, uh, I'll, I'll advocate for Larry if you need it. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? <laughs> Sheldon Bill Carey. 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 <laughs> it's going now. <laughs> What's that? It's got to go now. <laughs> I know the title. <laughs> An act to amend the Buildings Code Act. Shall it carry? Carry. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Carry. Carry. I say that. Shall it carry? For the record. I know you were thinking about that. We all knew you were thinking We were all thinking <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole House, having had under, having had under consideration a bill to be in titch, will an act to amend the Buildings Code Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed the same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Yeah. Call the hour. Honourable members, the hour has been called. <laughs> 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 the Honourable Member from Morrell, Donna, and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier, that this House adjourn until February 24th at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Shall I carry? Shall I carry?
time, folks.